Hi, I'm Jay Scott Ammon. Welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunt Podcast. I have a very complicated relationship with deer hunting, and on this podcast, we're going to talk about all of it. Deer hunting as entertainment, deer hunting as sport, deer hunting as food, deer hunting as fitness, deer hunting as therapy, deer hunting as conservation. I'll talk to expert deer hunters and the average deer hunters just like you and me. I hate to ask you to do anything, but if you are enjoying the show, please take a moment to like, subscribe, rate, review all of the above wherever you listen to podcasts. Today's show is with my good friend, John Norris. John is a former and retired California game warden, and he was on the forefront and the front lines of an underreported battle against thousands of drug cartel members who are growing toxic marijuana on U.S. soil. Not only does the black market marijuana cultivation undermine the legitimate growers in the United States, but it endangers lives and wildlife populations that are unimaginable. In John's book that he wrote called Hidden War, John talks about all of his experiences taking out drug cartels and all the missions that he's been on and what the global picture looks like with regards to this massive problem that that you wouldn't think a, a warden would necessarily encounter. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with John Norris. John Norris, welcome to the Big Buck Registry's Deer Hunting Podcast. How are you, my friend? Oh, Jay, great to be here. Thanks for having me, and I am doing great. Good to see you, buddy. Uh, this is episode number 300. Uh, th- this is wow. a, This is quite a moment for us, and I, I, I couldn't think of anybody better to have on our show than you uh, at number 300. It's really an honor to have you on. Well, I'm honored to be here, and that's, that's a special kudos to you for getting to 300 episodes on this great podcast, brother. That is super cool, and I'm, I'm glad to be on that uh, third century <laughs> That's pretty right, neat. Right. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's been a you know, it's been an interesting journey that we've been on with friends and guests of the show and it's opened up all kinds of avenues for me and all all my my partners in crime here and it's uh it's been it just it never ends like there's always a new opportunity there's always somebody very interesting that we get to meet on the other side and I, I never take it for granted like this is something we kind of created out of thin air, but man, it is so special. Yeah. You, you built something great brother. And you know, and I got to say thank you to you and for your listeners and viewers uh, that may not know this, but you've done a phenomenal job of being our producer for our warden's watch and thin green line podcasts that I co-host with uh, retired Lieutenant Wayne Saunders out of New Hampshire. And uh, you know, you make that thing a very professional podcast. We can't thank you enough. And um, you know, and in, in getting to know you as a producer of our podcast, I've started following Big Buck Registry and didn't even know you were out there before that, even though I've been a world, you know, worldwide lifetime conservationist and hunt as much as I've been a game warden. And just to see your site and everybody sharing great deer stories and you know, images from their hunts all year long, it just that picks you up on even the worst down day anybody's gonna have. So <laughs> Uh, I absolutely love, I love the site. I'm promoting the site and uh, thanks for all you're doing for us and for conservation as a whole with our, our hunting community, buddy. Very cool. I can, I can see a, uh, a nice buck over your right shoulder there. And I'm looking forward to hearing yeah. some stories about that. And you've got some muleys down there over your left shoulder. Oh yeah. So, yeah. Th- and it's an interesting concept, you know, you, sometimes you wonder if the warden you're talking to in the field is also a hunter based off of the questions that they ask, but right. there's indisputable you're a hunter too so this is this you're our kind of guy for this show i'm looking forward to getting into this yeah we've got some stories to share man it's gonna definitely be fun. yep so john you um you wrote a very interesting book and i want to get into the book in a second called hidden war but before you got into writing books you're a game warden, but before you're a game warden, you must have had some influences in your life that got you interested in that line of work. Not everybody I know gets interested in that that uh, profession. How did you get started? Yeah, it's it's an interesting story and an unconventional one, Jay. Um, unlike my colleagues that I went to the, the Fish and Wildlife uh, Law Enforcement Academy with way back, I'm going to date myself, way back in 1992, uh, I live in Montana now full time where, where my family, the north side of the family has been for 40 years, but I was a California resident growing up and a California fish and wildlife officer, a game warden and later a lieutenant. 
um, you know, did did the whole patrol stint of everything that that patrol entails to big game enforcement, angling enforcement, commercial wildlife sales, undercover by bus, marine patrol, and then eventually what we're going to talk about with Hidmore building the first special operations team of snipers and operators and uh, highly advanced canines all from a game warden team in California to fight the drug cartels out of Mexico for some heinous wildlife crimes. Um, but I don't want to jump too far ahead. It all started just with love and wildlife being uh, an angler and a hunter and conservationist um, from my dad, my uncles, my granddad, you know, I'm, we're multiple generations, you know, handing down, you know, the ethos of, of, of diehard conservationists and just loving the outdoors on all levels and wildlife on all levels. So I was hunting and fishing at, at nine years old. When I passed my hunter safety test, I was waterfowl hunting right after that. And then when I was of age, 12, 13, 14 years old, I was starting to go on my first deer hunts. And unlike all of my colleagues that I was in the Fish and Game Academy with in 1992 that had met a game warden at some point mm. in their hunting uh, exposure or career, if you will, I never met a game warden from the time I started hunting at nine years old until I was well on my way in college in, a, in an engineering degree major uh, to be an engineer. I was going to be a civil engineer. Um, possibly thinking about going to the military special forces under an ROTC program and studying engineering at the same time. When I finally met a game warden in the back country of Henry coast state park, the second largest state park in California, where literally I learned it, my first backpacking experience and uh, learned to see big black tail trophy deer, all that as I was growing up. And um, by the good graces, I ran into a game warden that was patrolling deep in the winter we were on a winter break in the middle of our Christmas break between semesters uh, at San Jose State University. And uh, my brother outlaw, I'm one of my best friends in second grade and also um, a race teammate on our, our Ironman racing team down in Baja, Mexico. Uh, we, were, we had a pack horse. We were doing a seven day trip in Co Park in the middle of winter, which nobody does. So there was nobody in 100,000 acres of park. The Rangers thought we were crazy, dumb kids. They were right. We were crazy, dumb kids. <laughs> we didn't have the good high tech waterproof gear that's out now, you know, right. uh, all these, all these good sponsor brands, you know, we, you and I are lucky to run with. So we had a horse camp 13 miles into the back country, soaking wet, our clothes, our tents, our sleeping bags. So we created a fire to, to dry everything out and warm up. And then here comes a game warden in four wheel drive compound low in his green truck working down to us. And I thought he was a park ranger associated with the state park we were in. Well, it turned out to be a game warden that was out there patrolling for late season, deep rut after season, uh, black tail deer hmm. uh, poaching. Okay. Because that was an area that got poached quite often because the genetics were so good for big bucks in that area. Um, and it was such a remote park that nobody got into that if they could get into the park and slip in undetected, good chance they would uh, they would get out with a trophy buck or spotlight a trophy buck, uh, you know, way out of season, deep in the rut um, when they're really dumb and easy to get to. Uh, this game warden realized we were just dumb college kids, ill-equipped. Uh, but I stopped him when he realized we weren't a poaching threat. He was about to leave. And I started, quite, you know, q and a him on what his what he was doing because I was blown away. And so two hours later, <laughs> he's finally leaving and going back on patrol. And Jeff, my partner, looked at me and he saw my eyes. He goes, dude, what is going on? You are just like fired up. I see this energy in you. He, <laughs> I said, that's my job. I am doing the wrong thing in school. That's what I need to do. When we get out of this hike, I need to fix this. I need to fix this problem. <laughs> and no kidding, Jay, seven days later, well, I still had four weeks before the next semester. We were on a five week winter break. I uh, drove straight to the criminal justice advisor's office at San Jose State and talked to them about what degree I needed to get into fish and wildlife and be a game warden, be a law enforcement officer for wildlife. And, uh, it's, it was a great program. It happened to be one of the best in the country. Hmm. I didn't lose any classes. I was only a semester or two into the engineering program. So I changed majors. Three weeks later, I was in a, a criminal justice program and it was off to the races and I never looked back. Wow. And uh, in, uh, in nine, that was, uh, that was ni uh, late 1986. And um, in 1992, I was finally picked up and hired when I was working on my graduate degree, kind of waiting for a, a hiring freeze to lift in California so I could have a shot at being a game warden. I was very blessed it happened uh, gotcha. back in 92. Yeah. 
That's cool, man. That's, uh, you know, sometimes we have those aha moments in life and you just know, yep. you just, you know that that's the right thing you got to go do. Yeah. That, that's, uh, it sounds like you had one of those moments. Well, and I think I was really lucky and blessed because had I not run into uh, Henry, the name of the game warden at the time that I met, uh, I would, you and I probably, well, I'm sure we wouldn't be having this conversation today. Um, right. It just, you know, I, there was there was some divine intervention, something for, for us to meet so far in the remote area, in an area and a time of the year that just doesn't get any traffic back there. Uh, wardens don't normally patrol then for sure it was a fluke thing and people don't backpack in that time that far back so i feel really lucky brother that it worked out the way it did and it it was definitely the right calling and i know it's it's been an amazing journey for sure don't go anywhere we'll be right back the call of the wild is in all of us we empower your desire for adventure Whether it's your first step into the uncharted or your annual backcountry hunt, we unlock confidence in the unknown so you can create successful outdoor experiences where the pavement ends, On X begins. Just a side note, and I'm I'm always try to figure this out and I can't really put my finger on it. Maybe you, you have a little more insight having a criminal justice background. I never equate the poacher with the hunter. Sometimes they look and smell a lot like the hunter, but to me, a hunt, my hunting community is not the poaching community at all. Like, but boy, they sure look like us sometimes. And that confuses that middle 80%. And so, so how, how do you, or middle 60%, depending on what you're looking at for stats, what's the psychology behind a poacher that needs to go crack, kill a, a trophy buck in the middle of nowhere um, to bring home? And I mean, what's, what's the goal there? I, I never understood why you needed to kill out of season or had to kill outside of the rules. These are creatures that are almost defenseless against the good hunters. So why do you have to even expose that? What's the psychology? Any idea? Yeah, you know it's it's interesting you bring that up because we we just uh, we just had uh, Barry Kirch, the uh, the drummer for the multi platinum rock band Shine Down, on our Thin Green Line podcast just an hour ago. He asked the exact same question. He's also a diehard conservationist and hunts and yep. field a table for his family, but. He was asking me and Wayne Saunders, my co-host on that show, he goes, guys, I just don't get it. I don't get, I mean, these guys are like serial killers who would want to go out and kill too many animals. How could they possibly thrive or be rewarded by that? You know, and how could they feel good with themselves of, of doing such a thing, knowing how much, you know, true conservationists and hunters, not poachers. And you said it beautifully, Jay love our wildlife. And, you know, there's a big distinction. Um, and you're right. The, the way the media uh, with media spin with television, hunters and poachers are sometimes synonymous. And sometimes we get into the fact that if you kill deer, even ethically, legally to feed your family, and you're kicking back into the conservation uh, program, and you're actually helping the deer herd, that doesn't that message doesn't always get conveyed, as you know. So we are really careful um, as game wardens. And when we teach conservation, hunters are ethical stewards of wildlife. Poachers are criminals. Right. And they are killers, murderers, you know, and I know that sounds kind of uh, harsh and judgmental, but I'm going to call a spade a spade because fortunately they are a very, very tiny percentage of any of the folks out there that are harvesting wildlife, killing wildlife for, for legitimate reasons. Um, The mindset from what I've seen in my career, brother, has been uh, the guys that are chronic. It's it's an addiction. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's like an addiction, like alcoholism, a drug addiction, gambling, uh, food, whatever. I've had the craziest poaching stories of guys I've had to you know come into contact with, make cases against that they could be everything from a methamphetamine addict that's got a huge criminal history of doing aggressive felonies, and now he's just out killing everything not to eat it, but he's actually killing animals to sell the meat for drugs right we actually had an episode of wild justice one of the you know our game warden reality show that started the whole kick of uh, game warden shows in california through national geographics wild justice we did three seasons of that and in the very first season i was involved 
our, our squad got involved in one of those cases that the film crews happened to be with us. And that did two things. There were some negative and positives from that experience. One, it showed the dark side of poaching for all the wrong reasons and all these dead deer this guy was killing to sell the meat commercially on the black market illegally to make to get money for meth. But then it made hunters look like meth addicts that are killing relentlessly and recklessly and this and the the separation wasn't really clear and pretty soon the you know the the general public that weren't like you and i come from a conservation background or any of our fellow big buck registry listeners and viewers and and participants every hunter now was suddenly that guy Hmm. you know and so hunting was a bad thing and we had to really tell some different stories and work with the producers to twist that narrative because we were California, right, wrong, or indifferent politically. It was still a conservation state. We still have a ton of resource. We have a ton of good hunting out there still. Um, I still hunt as an out-of-state non-resident now, back in my old home area. So that's the thing, and it, it was that type of thing. And but that particular felon, and then these sociopathic, you know, serial killers that go out because they're so addicted to doing it, and they get a thrill out of it, which is psychotic. You know, it's yeah. it's dark. Yeah. Um, Barry Wayne and I just talked about, it sounds like borderline serial killers. And I go, well, the mentality is the same. And I think if you escalate and desensitize when you, when you follow that type of psychology of, of, you know, serial murderers, um, they always start with, with wildlife or with small animals. There's always this, this history that I did get to study in criminal justice in my, in my program of the, the mindset of a serial murderer and a mass murderer. And it always starts with, getting thrills from killing animals yeah whether it's house cats and dogs or now it's deer it's frogs it's you know whatever the case may be so yeah there's a big difference brother but there is an element of serial animal killers out there that are diehard poachers they're wrecking our wildlife species nationally and it's the thin green line of conservation officers and yourself and our listeners that are out there as stewards of wildlife that are the force multiplier you know it's not just the game wardens making the cases it's all of our hunters and anglers and conservationists out there that are seeing this stuff go on and making that phone call because guys like Wayne and I, we can't possibly make a case without help. Right. Our, our, our best poaching cases where we actually stop the problem from happening are when, when your viewers and your listeners literally see something out there because they're so outraged by the atrocity of, of the poaching crime that they, they, you know, the 1-800 turn in a poacher number, they make that call and we couldn't, we couldn't be effective without it. And we're grateful. Yeah. I think when you, when you encounter a poacher or you hear of a poaching scenario as a hunter, it's got to infuriate you beyond just the, somebody that doesn't hunt. Like I'm sure they're akin to it and they're, they're, it doesn't make them happy, but a hunter, it makes you furious because you work so hard to do the right thing, to follow the rules and to send the right message. If you're uh, thinking about this kind of stuff to, to the people that, that matter in between when votes matter and legislation matters, that, that just, I mean, there isn't, I'm not really an angry guy. You know, I'm I'm typically pretty happy go lucky and and get along, but that's that is one thing that fires me up and I really think that that might be one of the reasons I started this this show in the very first place was because that was a you know, it it hit a nerve every time I heard of a poaching case going on. It really drove me insane. Yeah, no, I I share it with you and I'm glad you're as passionate about it as you are because like I said you um, you know, our mutual colleagues, uh, your listeners, all those, all those conservationists that, that contribute pictures or that are part of subscribing to the big buck registry. There, there are stewards of wildlife, brother. They are right. the stewards of wildlife. They are the thin green line part of it, holding back the tide. And without us out there doing what we do without being in the field as, as hunters and anglers, it would run amok. Um, we already know that through COVID with all the shutdowns, uh, you know, I know we're going to talk about the cartel threats in America that hid mortgages into, and you know, the, the latter part of my career and that fight that's still going on in a little bit, but up until that point, um, we're still looking at massive impacts to wildlife species now because there's so few law enforcement presence, patrol officers, and in some cases, hunters where seasons have been shut down because of COVID, uh, you know, patrol restrictions are on because of exposure to, uh, you know, this, this pandemic virus, this COVID-19. Yep. Um, so little things like that, that we just are so recent and it's timely that we're talking about this and doing the podcast now 
have made it an even harder impact on our wildlife resources through this pandemic um, because there's less enforcement. There's a lot of restrictions and poachers feed off that chaos, just like the cartels do in America. They feed off of disruption and chaos where we're all tied up doing other things for immediate survival needs. And now the woods are open season. Right. And, uh, and we've noticed that. And I, I, you know, speak with my colleagues in California, not only, uh, my old teammates on the special operations, marijuana enforcement team front, but also the patrol wardens and they're underwater. I, the, the stories I'm hearing from 2020 in California for clandestine trespass, marijuana grows being done by the cartels to deer poaching cases and, you know, uh, wildlife trafficking cases off the freaking hook hmm. because these guys see an opportunity for a thrill. They see profit in it and, you know, they end up decimating species. Right. And it, it, it's horrible to see and uh, we need the help. All right. Let's get into that in just a little bit too and go to do a deeper dive. So you're in retirement now, right? Sort of. Sort of. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you, phase two, phase two, I like to call it. Yeah. yeah phase yeah. two, you spent a career uh, as a game warden. And right. this is uh, in, in retirement, you wrote a book called Hidden War. And I have dissected the book. I've, I've listened to it numerous Thank times you. on my walks. Um, it, it's a fascinating deep dive into your career and the people that were around you. And you, you talk about some global issues too, about, you know, this even goes into politics in a lot of ways. And it unfortunately has to, yeah. right. It unfortunately has to, but you've opened my eyes to something I didn't even connect i didn't know that the there i mean as a game warden and then the game wardens i know in new hampshire certainly they've busted some illegal growing scenarios in new hampshire i've, I've seen it there was a, a orange bucket case um a while back where they kept finding um, marijuana plants growing in the woods of new hampshire in a home depot buckets for some reason right. i don't know why they chose the orange <laughs> bucket but if i was yeah. gonna if i was gonna grow marijuana in the middle of nowhere i certainly wouldn't put it in an orange bucket you know it just right. seems kind of <laughs> silly so they're not very sophisticated criminals um sure. but as a game warden what the the types of uh, missions that you were on the types of things that you uncovered and opened your eyes to a much larger problem that you eloquently describe in the book it just doesn't seem like as you entered into this profession that this was anything you'd ever encounter anything that you'd ever <laughs> just yeah. think that was even connected to uh, poaching to drug cartels where how you know that doesn't connect usually so what's the premise of the book how what made you decide to write the book and what is it overall about yeah you, you hit it on the head when you talked about it. it's such an unconventional type of work that generally from a public perception or even from being a hunter uh, you know you don't think of game wardens fighting the drug cartels you know tacked out as a special operations paramilitary paramilitary type SWAT unit with advanced canines and sniper teams and uh you know, air assets like helicopters, but that's essentially what the book is about and what we morphed into. And to, to go back to what you just said in 1992, when I was in that fish and wildlife Academy and that young, you know, 21 year old cadet, I wanted to bust deer, you know, guys spotlighting deer at night, taking deer out of season guys, gill net and fish, the traditional stuff. I right. wanted to stop poaching because I loved hunting and fishing so much. Right. Um, I never in a million years, Jay, imagined that I would be, you know, supervising a tactical or building and co-founding and developing the first tactical unit of its type of game wardens in the country, really, um, to where that's all we did as a dedicated force. Um, so what the book is about and the reason we named it, it's called Hidden War, how special operations game wardens are reclaiming America's wildland from the drug cartels. Uh, we named it Hidden War because your response is exactly what the public in general and even our wildlife uh, as fisciandos, our conservationists that are out there hunting all the time, have no idea it's going on. Uh, my first book, War in the Woods, was written a decade before, hmm. while, I, while I was still operational. Um, and that book, uh, there was a great publishing opportunity. Uh, my chief bought off on it. Nancy Foley was our chief at the time and was actually starting to let us start to work and, and encourage us to work with sheriff's departments and other allied law enforcement agencies on these cartel grows because and we're talking, you know, we're talking way back in uh, 2010, 
you know, in 2004, 2005, early 2000s, when we started to see this problem on the West Coast. And uh, 10 years later, I write a second book about a tactical unit that's been doing it. Um, we showed this on Wild Justice on a worldwide number one hit Game Warden reality show, uh, Wild Justice in three seasons. Those of us that were doing this type of work with allied agencies were highlighted episodes. And so this message was going everywhere, yet it was amazing how little attention it got outside of TV, news, uh, news profile pieces that I'd talk about uh, for press when I was still operational, and then the book. Um, and, and Hidden War is a perfect name for the book because this is happening right under Americans' noses in every state, not just in California where I came from. Um, we have cartels embedded throughout America that once they're here, unless they're deported as deportable felons, and we're not talking about legitimate immigration, and you know, we, we don't get too political on this. It's really kind of a black and white issue. Um, this is not legitimate immigration. This is deportable, hardened criminal felons from south of the border that are part of cartel cells uh, that are on, many are on international watch lists for having multiple felonies, weapons charges, narcotic trafficking, murder, aggressive assaults, very, very, you know, evil, dangerous individuals that are embedded throughout America, a lot in California for growing black market cannabis. And when this stuff is grown, Jay, as I talk about in the book, as you're familiar with, um, they're bringing in EPA banned chemicals and pesticides and insecticides that are so toxic and so deadly to people, to wildlife, waterways, and to just habitat that they were banned by the EPA over 20 years ago from being used in our country hmm. on our agricultural products. Um, so it gets smuggled from Mexico where they can still buy it down there, brought into the country with their tier one growers. And, you know, this stuff is everywhere. It's in the soil, it's in the waterways, it's on the flower and the bud material on the cannabis that's dried and then distributed all over the black market for unsuspecting cannabis users buying off the black market. Uh, some of this stuff is actually making it into dispensaries unknowingly. So in a, in a regulated state that has legitimate cannabis, like my old state of California, you, know, you have a, a percentage of growers that are trying to do things 100% legal organically pure. They're not stealing water. The last thing they want to do is have poison on their weed that's going out to medicinal patients. It's going out to recreational users where it's legal to do so, not only in California, but about 15 other states now. Yet they're getting this stuff on it, you know? Um, and that's, <laughs> it's not only a wildlife destroyer, this is a human and health safety issue for, you know, our consumers of cannabis all over the country. Um, so I wrote the book, to get this message out for the sake of the nation, not only for California, not only for game wardens, but to show the environmental impacts to what you and I and, and uh, our, our listeners are so passionate about our wildlife resources, gotcha. our deer herds, our elk herds, our antelope, our turkey, our steelhead trout, because no exaggeration, brother, two tablespoons of this poison that they put on that cannabis, if it gets into a, a little tributary creek and you, we want to, we want our, everybody to realize that these grows are in such remote areas some of the time, most of the time, that they are sucking the water right where the headwaters of a nice stream starts. So not only are they stealing the water, but they're also putting these chemicals that, that leach back into that pristine stream that feeds bigger creeks, and then it feeds lakes, and then it feeds drinking water sources for cities. And two tablespoons of this stuff can literally kill two to five miles of a trout tributary stream and every red-legged frog, yellow-legged frog, aquatic, every fish species in it because it's so nasty. It's a nerve agent. It's anticoagulant. What it does to a big black bear, to a trophy mule deer, if it ingests just a, just a, a couple droplets of this stuff in a grow site, uh, it's a deadly nerve toxic reaction. They're frothing at the mouth. They die from the inside out. It's a horrible way for an animal to perish. And this stuff kills a lot of big game animals in grow sites all over the country. That's crazy. So such a small amount can do so much damage. Right? Yeah. That's insane. What um let's let's go to some of your missions and your book is, is just loaded with these crazy adventures. I mean just stuff yeah, that right. you, that you would it's it's almost stuff that you would akin to Navy SEAL operations. I mean these are these are things that you just don't associate with game wardens typically you know like you said the the, the traditional stuff busting guys that are trying to shoot at mechanical deer on the side of the road some of the stuff you'd see on tv occasionally but this is sure. deeper this is this is hardcore this is 
stuff I would say really fits more uh, military DEA special forces kind of stuff. Right. It's insane. Could you uh, maybe go back to one of your early missions that might have been given or might have given you an aha moment of what you were dealing with? When did you realize that, hey, th- th- this isn't just a poaching case. This is this is drug related and this is way more damaging than anything we've seen before. Yeah, it, it really started, Jay. 2004 was the first time in the Silicon Valley. I, was, uh, I wasn't a lieutenant yet. I was a patrol warden in my old hometown area, South Silicon Valley, uh, Foothills, where I grew up. And I remember it's the first chapter in the first book that goes into this because this was the aha moment, as you say, you know, what very well said, uh, oh my gosh, we're not, in, you know, we're not in Kansas anymore. We're not anymore, in Kansas Toto. anymore, right? We are not in Kansas anymore. We just walked into, you know, we went into the upside now and like the kids say, right, with right. Uh, Stranger Things. Stranger it, Things, That's right. literally what we walked into. One of my best buddies growing up um, was at San Jose State as a fisheries biologist doing his master's thesis on steelhead trout, uh, different species of frogs, and doing transect studies on vitality uh, in an area very close to where I met that game warden on the edge of Coe Park. And he called me one day, and I want to say this was probably in April around our trout season opener, and I had been out all weekend working trout fishermen and you know limits with kids and things like that. And he said, hey, uh, John, I got a problem. I got two tributaries in my study area, and I've been studying this thing for three years now, and one is bone dry. Hmm. And it shouldn't be dry in in April. All the winter runoff, this thing should be ripping. I've got, you know, little pieces of plastic, and it looks like, uh, you know, like black uh, water pipe tubing and little chunks that's like drifted down from way up upstream somewhere. And frogs and fish and everything is, they're dead. I, I got no water in this channel. Okay. I said, well, that's a huge problem. And I said, can you jump in the truck with me? We're going to go up. Let's find a jump off spot and let's dive into that canyon and find out where this block or diversion, this water diversion is happening. And he said, sure, of course. I mean, he knew the area like the back of his hand. Um, And, you know, Jay, we we have a certain mindset of what we're going to expect based on experiences game wardens. And when I see a, a creek dried up, it tells me one of two things in the old traditional world that the water's being diverted for agriculture illegally somewhere Mm -hmm. to another property. Maybe it's a water diversion to get water for a a development of property or a build of some sort. Um, And that's what I expected to see. And when we dove into that Canyon and it was, and brother, pristine, gorgeous. I mean, I've seen creeks. I mean, it rival creeks in the grand Canyon when I've actually rafted and hiked the base of the grand Canyon and some of those tributaries in the Silicon Valley, it was so gorgeous in this site. I'd never been in there my whole life. And I grew up right next to it and we're, we're hiking down and we find where where they're called check dams that the cartels build in these, these tributaries. And here's a, an earthen check dam of rocks and bisqueen line plastic to kind of encapsulate the water and make a dam and a water line. And, you know, basically a tributary water line going out the bottom of the dam. And I didn't know it at the time, but there was like a orange type sheen in the water where the visqueen was, where the dam was. Unbeknownst to me, it was those uh, furadan and metaphos and carbofuran, all those prohibited chemicals that had come in because right. I hadn't seen a cartel grow yet. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of spoiler alert. I don't know what I'm seeing, but I'm going to learn real quick. And so we tactically and very quietly um, went down that creek channel about 100 yards following the black water line that was taking water somewhere. And now we start seeing 18 inch marijuana plants on both sides Mm. of the bank. We start seeing all this, you know, manzanita and coyote brush and willow trees that are all good habitat that keep those banks nice and stable on the edge of that pristine Creek gone. So we have Mm. all this erosion. I I automatically start thinking as a game word, Oh man, the first rain is going to hit that soil that doesn't have any root system or any vegetation on it. And boom, that's going to wash right into this tributary, knowing full well that that tributary was, was a, a tributary to Coyote Creek, one of our last steelhead trout spawning channels left in the Bay Area. And I think most of our listeners know, and if they don't know, the steelhead trout is federally and state listed as an endangered species. And the federal, uh, you know, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service put their value at about twenty-two dollars to $30,000 of fish wow. because they're so impacted. So I had no idea they were poisoned and dead from this chemical. But jumping ahead, we, we go down and we see these plants and then we see two growers and they do not look like they belong in the woods. These guys are, you know, definitely looked of Latin or, or, or South American descent. 
They're dressed in camouflage or the OD green BDUs. Yep. Um, they've got they've got AK 47s <laughs> They've got machetes. They've got handguns, and they're walking around tending their garden and changing water systems and trimming. But they're walking around in this thing tactically, like we would as law enforcement officers, even to the level of being, like you said, a SEAL team or a special operations small unit team, uh, SWAT, if you will. And they were watch, walking slowly. They were looking around with their head on a swivel, looking for anybody that might be coming into their grow. Their situational awareness was at a peak. They were watching their six o'clock, what we call the tail gunner position on our tactical unit. And I'm, you know, leaning up against a cut bank and these guys are 15, 20 yards from us. And I have an unarmed civilian buddy that, you know, can, can handle himself in the woods. But that was an oh crap moment career wise. Right. I have an AR-15 with my red dot, no radio coverage. I can't get out on a radio. There's no cell coverage. We are deep in a canyon. And if these guys keep coming close, we're going to have contact. There's no way to avoid it. And that probably, that might've been a career ender if it had gone the wrong way. Right. Uh, quite honestly. But fortunately, we stayed hidden. They drifted away. They tended their plants and they went further up canyon. And we both, with those big pie eyed, what did we just see? We hiked our, you know, tail, hightailed it out of there straight up a canyon back to the truck. And then my, my, you know, mind was spinning. Now I just saw the worst poaching criminal I'd ever been across. I saw the biggest environmental impact of any wildlife crime I'd ever encountered as a game warden. Yet it wasn't something game wardens do. And I didn't know what to do. So it was call a narcotics task force, a local agent, um, bring all these agencies together. And as uh, that's the Palisoo Ridge chapter, the, the first chapter in War in the Woods, the first book, it goes into how we learned, you know, kind of stumbling forward without having any resources of how we deal with these crimes. And uh, we were part of a task force. We were the guides to get them into the area. We weren't really trusted at that point to have any enforcement knowledge of how to deal with these guys what to do with the plants. So we kind of followed along and we learned a lot on that mission. And a year later, the second chapter in the first book goes into, we're helping the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office, their marijuana eradication team, their special ops unit dedicated to that. Um, we had met on that first mission in 2004 that, I, that we had really been like-minded and they were gracious enough to take us game wardens in as equals as fellow conservationists, because the cool part about the sheriff's guys that we were working with on that Met Team J, you know, they came from your neck of the woods. They were upstate, they were Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, mid, the Midwest. They were all big deer hunters. Yep. They hated what they were seeing. Even though they weren't game wardens, they were conservationists. They were thin green liners. So we had that bond starting back in 04. And now we're on one of their missions in our county, back in San, northern Santa Clara County. And we walk into an ambush during harvest time and uh, we're undermanned with a six man unit and the whole mountainside was being harvested in probably 10 different grows. There were probably 20 to 30 cartel operatives up there. Wow. We got to just one and we took one round of AK 47 SKS fire from a military round from that caliber. And it went right through my young warden partner's legs, penetrated both his legs. He had four holes. Um, he went down. I ended up engaging uh, one of the suspects that may or may not have been the guy that shot him. We suspect it was my partners on the sheriff's office were in a gunfight with their AR 15s on another gunman that was actually crouched down with a sawed off shotgun pointed at me and another game warden at seven yards through brush that we never saw. So had uh, snake as he's codenamed my partner from the sheriff's office and Apache, uh, Mike D'Amigo, who now since has passed away, sadly, uh, had they not engaged that suspect, I wouldn't be here having this talk with you. Right. Uh, right. No, no exaggeration on that. Um, but when that all went down and we had an officer shot and by the good graces, um, my partner survived. Uh, he almost didn't. He slipped into shock. He was incredible blood loss. We waited three hours to get an air rescue to get him out of there. So that was an eye opener, not only for us as game wardens, but for law enforcement agencies in general in the Bay Area. How do you have an evacuation plan for this type of mission? When did the when did we get drug cartels in the Silicon Valley foothills of California right. and unbeknownst to us in 25 other states all over the country embedded? You know, we had barely scratched the surface, but brother, the thing I knew that day, I knew in 2004 when we helped that one agency with the first raid we found with my biology buddy, biologist, and I knew it when we got in that gunfight, I said, this has to stop. Right. This is the worst, most egregious wildlife criminal I've ever seen. They're not even here legally. They are definitely international criminals, and they're definitely more aggressive 
with less of a concern for human life and no concern for wildlife. It's there to be taken. Habitat is there to be destroyed for black market profits for the cartel. These guys are nasty. And I said, it's going to be a tough job. It's going to be a dangerous job, but there are game wardens that need to focus on this just like these sheriff's deputies are. But we need to bring the environmental component to the game because what was happening at the time, Jay, is these raid teams were going in, chopping all the plants down, maybe taking them out, maybe disposing of them on site, right? Maybe hardly catching anybody because nobody was, was getting funded for arrests. They were getting funded for plant count from, from the DEA and from our, our DCEP grant that comes federally every year to each agency. Thing that was so horrible about that is I'm going in and raiding with these agencies and we're cutting plants and we're not catching anybody. And then we're helicoptering or hiking out. And I'm like, whoa, 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 time out. <laughs> the job's only halfway done. Look at that Creek diversion, man. Look at those dead animals. Look right. at all this trash. Look at what, what is that pink stuff in a bottle? What's carbofuran in this container? You know, we're handling stuff. That's like, you can't even handle it without nitrile gloves and an N95 respirator. Right. So, that stuff was left in the woods as a super fun site. So even though we got the criminal element out and, and, and the, the weed is destroyed, that stuff's still in the water. Winter comes, it just washes it further down. Right. So the exponential effects on our deer habitat, our elk, our antelope, our, our big game, our small game, our upland game, it was exponentially horrendous, man. So that's when I started to informally get involved and do more and more. In fact, it got to a point where <laughs> my immediate chain of command were kind of like, Oh, great. You're helping the sheriffs again. You ever going to do real game warden work? Right. Uh, right. We're going to go, you know, go, go write a fishing ticket. You're going to do a deer case. I'm like, uh, yeah, I'm going to do a deer case. I'm going to stop this grow. And about 20 big trophy black tail bucks are going to maybe live right. because they're all killed and all poached in these, uh, in these grow sites. And, Something else on that, I know, I, I think I talked about this in the book. You may remember this, but uh, you know the movie Predator? Yeah. yeah it's one of, I love sure. the original especially. Right. And you know, there were all these spinoffs of Predator, right? As, as big game hunters, we kind of like the intergalactic Predator premise. It's just totally. It's, it's just a great one, story. One of my, you know? one of my most favorite yeah. movies. One yes. of your favorites, right? Yeah. I love you, man. Yeah, I feel the same way. But it, you remember in some of the Predator scenes where – uh, when Arnold or later, I think it was uh, Adrian Brody and in, in Predators, where they had that right. hunting crew and they had trophies hanging in camp. Yep. They had heads of animals, heads of people. Well, that's what some of these grow sites are like. We would walk into these grow sites and here's all these, you know, trees, you know, that surround um, a, a plot of where the, the tainted marijuana is being grown. And there's, you know, a 22 inch four point black tail deer rack. And then here's another big Pacific Fork that's a trophy by anybody's standards. It's just a massive, big, you know, good mass, dark root beer horned, big old granddaddy uh, swamp donkey Pacific Fork, four or five trophies. And I'm like, wait a minute, something doesn't add up. These are cartel growers. How the heck are they getting all these damn trophy bucks when they're in here growing weed, making noise? This isn't, I mean, I've spent 20 years trying to get a buck that good. Right. Doing it the right way. Right. You know, and just enjoying the process. And a biologist told me about 10 years ago, she goes, you know what? You know what marijuana, when it's when it buds and has that stink, it's catnip to deer. Really? So deer, deer smell this stuff and they're coming in from areas that aren't even their geographic region. So like baiting in an area where it's illegal, think of what that's doing, Jay. It's bringing in an inordinate, about, an inordinate amount of these trophy genetics of these big bucks. And then these guys are using their pellet guns so they don't make gunfire to be, you know, heard. They're trying to stay stealthy and under the radar. So they're using high caliber pellet guns to kill these deer. They're parting them out for meat. Maybe they eat the meat. Maybe they don't because these deer are probably poisoned because they drink water that's tainted with the toxic chemicals. Right, right. But then they skin out the head like, look, this deer is never going to touch my marijuana plant and kind of a sick little trophy. And they'd be all around. And I'm looking at four deer understanding the genetics and, and the biodiversity of, of deer herd management and going, oh, my gosh. This is deer from like a 10 square mile area, maybe larger. Why are there so many big bucks in the area? They all got sucked in from the catnip, the marijuana, the budded marijuana. Then they got killed. And that's not counting what the poison did to the other animals. So right. I was seeing exponential levels of wildlife loss, not only immediately in the site, but pervasively going on for months, if not years, if we didn't do something. And needless to say, I knew at that point it had to be a specialty, but you know, just politically and, and traditionally minded game warden mentality, we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it and have a specialized team of game wardens 
until the second book, until the six years that Hidden War goes into from 2013 to when I retired at the end of 2018, it goes into, and you said it best, these crazy stories. Uh, you know, I think I highlighted two of our six gunfights with cartel members, multiple canine, uh, you know, ambushes, um, the life saving of these dogs. You know, you and I were dog guys, you know, our, our, our hunters out there, the big buck registry, we love our dogs. Yep. Right working dogs, their pets, you know, their, their police, uh, law, law enforcement, military canines. And, uh, that's, that's the, that's why we wrote the book, brother. We had to get that message out for the American public, especially our outdoor enthusiasts to understand what is happening in our forests. Yeah. Uh, and, and the thing too, to remember is if you're not an outdoor enthusiast and you, you're never going to run into a cartel grow and you're not worried about poison water, you don't really know deer herds even if you have no concept of what's going on out there or don't see the joy in it, you still don't want to see poison water. You still don't want to see dead animals. Nobody wants to see an animal die poison that way. Um, and we need to remember that these cartel groups are the same groups from the same cells, just doing different jobs. It's a business model of tainted cannabis production for the black market during the summer months in, in states that, gr that have a really good climate for growing outdoor marijuana, like California being one of six Mediterranean climates on the globe. And to a lesser extent, 27 other states all the way back to where you're at now. But these same cartels are making methamphetamine for the black market. They're making the synthetic heroin fentanyl that is so dirty and, and so erratically dosed and made so poorly that it's killing thousands of people in America. Um, they're into the prescription narcotic lookalike pills we found out mm. from Bill Bodner, the, the sack with DEA that was on our Thin Green Line podcast yep. a while ago that you produced. Um, and there, and the, this thing on human trafficking that's got so much attention finally and the child sex uh, exploitation and trafficking, same groups. Right. From Mexico, doing a multi-billion dollar enterprise within our borders and and running amok. Yep. Um, so, yeah, and we didn't know all this yet, but essentially that's what our team is fighting in Hidmore. Now we know the threat and now we're doing it right. Gotcha. Um, we're, we're doing it with the right weaponry. We're doing it without any logistic red tape. We are, you know, kind of my SEAL buddies say you guys are kind of like the SEAL Team 6 of Game Wardens from the standpoint of you don't work in any one sector. You go anywhere in the state you need to. You work it with anyone you need to. Um you have, you know, a really good amount of resources, mm -hmm. whether it's helicopter assets, vehicles, training time, weaponry, ammunition, great dogs and, and great guys. Right. Um, and it was it was a real, real oddball step for a game or an agency to do. And I'm really blessed that we were able to do it and that we have the support of really good leaders like like Nancy Foley and later Mike Carrion, one of my mentors and a chief that retired before I did that if it hadn't been for Mike. Uh, the hidden war story would never happen because the team would have never been built. Right. Um, and now we're helping other States do it. It's not so oddball anymore because uh, you know, like our military brothers fighting the uh, war on terror overseas in the sandbox and other places throughout the globe, this is a domestic eco-terrorism war happening within borders, a little quieter, not quite as violent. You're not getting in as many gunfights and stuff, but it's no different. It's just affecting us a lot closer to home and it's affecting our wildlife resources. So my SEAL team and Delta team buddies that I work at, you know, we work in that circle in tactics and things. Mm -hmm. They look at this thing and they're outraged. They go, man, if I can get back in the game, become a reserve game warden, you know, go back as a second career or whatever. And we've had guys do that. They've literally come in from special forces and leave the military and, and mainline forces yeah. and go, hey, I had no idea game wardens had that going on. And I have always been a hunter and a fisherman. I want to join a team like that. And when you're getting to that demographic of, of, of great Americans and very skilled, you know, with a, with a high set of skill sets, um, that's what we need. That's, what, that's how we need to tackle it. And we're lucky that's happening. Yeah. I can, I can see how that's attractive to guys that might be coming in from military ops and say, yeah. Oh man, this is right on my home turf. Let's go. From going full speed, like a Ferrari and yep. now they're you know, hitting a wall and they're walking, you right. know, it's right. It's, they yep. want to do they want to keep going yep. yeah what what i mean i'm trying to like wrap my head around what inspires a drug cartel to cross the border to grow on american soil and do all this decimation is it because they decimated all the lands that they've already been on uh, 
below the border? Or, I mean, I just, I'm, what motivates them to come? And, and it seems like it'd be more dangerous for them to be on the soil than to stay on the other side of the border. You know, that's a great question that no one's asked. I'm glad you brought it up. And, and it's, it's a three pronged approach. Um, they come across the border because they can, for one. And also because if they're really embedded and they're really good at what they do, the odds of them getting caught have gone up quite a bit since team like ours have developed and got more focused and just gotten better and right. not come in so you know, overwhelmed and kind of ignorant to the problem and how to handle it. But um, they oversaturate the market because they know they're going to lose grows. So for instance, in Mexico, they're still doing it and they're still growing in the central, you know, the highlands of Michoacan and central Mexico, but the federales down there are attacking that very aggressively. And so if you're doing it down there, um, it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit looser there on rules of engagement restrictions and things like that when they're dealing with the federales or the, or the, you know, the Mexican national guard, sure. because they attack it a lot harder because the cartels are so much more violent with, with within, within their own groups mm. and, and rival of, of rival cartels in Mexico. Um, there's a bigger risk to getting hurt, you know, growing it down there if you are detected. Um, and there's just a lot more violence associated with it. Once they slip up here, we do have the violence, but it's still far lesser scale because it's bad for their business to be fighting with each other and, you know, killing each other. We, we see that. We've seen shallow graves with rival game members buried in groves before. Um, we've seen, you know, dead growers show up for no apparent reason. And we know something nefarious happened along those lines. But when they know some of it's being interdicted in Mexico and not all of it's going to make it up here, they start embedding here because they know they can get a good percentage of it on the black market before it's detected. Um, and then they also come in and I have a lot of pictures, as you know, in hidden more in the hardcover. We have a lot of color in black and white pictures. We really, I'm really grateful to Caribou Publishing, which is the book side of Gun Digest magazine and Recoil magazine and Recoil TV yep. that my brand is part of. Um, they wanted to make this a visual book as well as a story book and really get into not only the science, the action of the missions, uh, the maps, the GPS, the tactics, but show what this stuff looks like. You know, what does a panga boat look like? The third way they bring, you know, tainted weed for the black market into America and methamphetamine and traffic people is they bring a one-way panga boat from Mexico all the way around, you know, the Sea of Cortez side, yep. refuel it a hundred plus miles off the San Diego coastline and drop these boats just in the surf at random spots up the California, Oregon and Washington coastline and have a crew waiting to take the load and take the, the, the boat navigators out. And they just, they basically scuttle the boat. Hmm. And that only started about 10 years ago. And it was very effective. About 21 of these panga boats, Jay hit the coat, the West coastline every month and maybe three to five are interdicted. So when every one of those panga boats has three to 6,000 pounds of processed, ready for sale, ready to consume tainted marijuana and maybe some meth, maybe some fentanyl and who knows what else. I mean, there's been links to, you know, terrorism infiltration through the cartels this way. And what a great way to get, you know, a, a terrorist cell into America, then put them on a panga boat that has a 90% chance of making it not only to the coastline, but of getting out into the American populace. Right. So we see these boats showing up, um, you know, not all of them make it for the cartels, but a percentage do. And when one boat costs them three, four hundred thousand dollars with the high horsepower four stroke motors and the construction to be gunmetal gray and blue to match the sea, to be hard to detect, they put a lot of money into these boats, but it's a drop in the bucket compared to the profit. Right. You know, they're going to make 10, 11, 12 million dollars of profit from one boatload of tainted weed and the boat costs them 250,000. It's just a, it's an oil spill waiting to happen, floating there in the surf most of the time when we find them. So to your point or to your question, that's why they're working within state because they don't have to get into the border issue of it being interdicted at the border. They take that chance. Um, infrastructure is far easier to supply than trying to risk a lot of federale, you know, impacts down at the growth site itself if it's interdicted, but then smuggling all that, all the so many hundreds and thousands of tons obtained weed across the border, knowing it's a lot of it's going to get picked up. Right. So it's a three prong approach to, to maximize profit and maximize yeah. effectiveness. So it sounds like they just took advantage of a, of a place where our government w wasn't looking. They're not looking right. over there. We'll just go over there. They, we they that, found a yep. weak spot. They found a, yep. the, a shadow to, to kind of hang out in. 
with right. it, without the risk. So the risk reward was much greater simply by coming across the border. That yep. that makes total Perfectly sense. Said. Wow, yeah. interesting. I wanted to kind of get into some of the characters in the book. You certainly oh, okay. have a bunch of them. Um, right. And I, I don't know if we have time to get into to all of them, but you had some great names, uh, partners of yours that you've worked with. It's just Apache, I think you mentioned it. Just some fantastic code names. But the one that I really want to focus on in on is the fur missile. Uh, oh, let's Phoebe. Talk. All right. <laughs> you know, and I can. I mean, dogs are so ingrained in, in hunting and hunting culture in, in all kinds of ways, and, and certainly, I mean, this is man's best friend. But when yeah. you have when you have a partner. That's there to to help assist you, especially one that's well trained. And it sounded to me, as you described Phoebe, that without that dog, a lot of these things could have gone awry. And in fact, there was a, a time after Phoebe passed that you described a new dog that came in that right. didn't have the the instincts yet yes, of yeah. that Phoebe had acquired. So there, there's a there's a training process. Can you, can you tell me some some things about Phoebe and, and, and how a dog aided in taking out some of the these grow sites? Yeah, man i I could talk about I could talk about that blessing Phoebe all day long, and I'm I'm actually getting a little choked up right now thinking about yeah, her. Yeah, it dives you know, deep, right? Yeah, it, it, and I appreciate that. You know, we we lost her to leukemia um, the last year I was operational. It was 2018. Um, and she made it to an amazing 13 years old before she died of that, that, that disease, um, given the career she had, it, 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 it was crazy. So to put it in perspective for, for, for our listeners, um, we had two levels of canines in, in our department of fish and wildlife, and most agencies have similar and, and military war dogs are similar to our dual purpose dogs. Um, sometimes they have to bite to kill. They have to bite to stop bombs, you know, so, you know, Taliban hunting dogs with seal with the seal teams might be a little different than our apprehension dogs, but not much. Um, Phoebe was a Belgium Alana, um, female, awesome dog, the same breed that the seal teams and, and other special forces use because they're very smart um, and they're very good in, a, in multiple environments. Hmm. And Brian Boyd, codename Rumble, um, you know, who right. is the, the my brother from another mother forever, one of my closest friends. And, you know, he came over to Met right away when we built the team. And he's be, become the guru kind of canine trainer for, for our whole state and really a mentor to a lot of other states all over the country and other agencies because Brian had the passion and the energy. And when he got Phoebe, you know, you have that one, one in a million dog and one in a million handler that when they come together, magic happens. I call it, you know, I call it the comet. It, you know, you just see that meteor shower, you see that shooting star. And mm -hmm. it's, and I know that sounds kind of, uh, it's grand, but I, I can't understate that because those two came together at a time when we were just starting to do this marijuana uh, problem and integrate with agencies and fight the cartels. And the agencies that normally did that job, when we didn't, like sheriff's departments, in Brian's case, Shasta County, they didn't have a dog that did that job. You know, yeah, they had canines in the city and they had canines in their rural deputies, but to get canines that could go on a one, two, four, eight mile hike in 90 plus degrees in the middle of summer, you know, and not overheat, not dehydrate, not, you know, freak out right. with, with the elements and still be able to bite and apprehend a very violent criminal that's probably going to try to hit him, going to try to stab him, going to try to do all this heinous canine, you know, anti-canine tactics um, just to, to just get out of that thing, you know, uh, successfully was really hard. So Phoebe was by no means the perfect dog in the beginning. I mean, before I started working with Brian and she started getting in the, into the cartel hunting game, you know, she had about two years of trial and error, um, just like Canine Champ, who you read about in Hidden War at the end. We're, we were trying to retire Phoebe out, even though the vet still certified her as a working dog, and she was our best dog by hands down in the fleet, so to speak, of a very small fleet of, of dual purpose apprehension and detection canines. Um, we were trying to just ease her out. She was already 11, 12 years old. Yep. You know, that is, that's, that's a couple years older than most canines doing her job ever make it anyway, but she just happened to be healthy enough to still do it miraculously. And because she was a star on wild justice, she was, uh, she was a big hit dog with all of our other dogs that were in our game warden reality show. So the country loved her, 
you know, other countries loved Phoebe from what they were seeing on TV. And to, you know, to have her in missions where she could get stabbed or shot or stomped on by, a, you know, an armed AK-47 armed cartel gunman in a grow site at 12 or 13 years old, that's not something you want to explain. It's not something we wanted to really have happen, but we just couldn't get other dogs up to that level fast enough. Um, but by the time she retired, Jay, she had had a record-breaking 116 apprehension bites in a career. Hmm. Um, and on top of that, she had 900 more arrests of, of armed cartel gunmen that, that gave up, that she didn't have to bite. So even when I talk to my SEAL buddies that are canine handlers that know what a war dog you know, does and how aggressively they had to be at the peak of our war on terror overseas, they're blown away that a female canine Malinaw in the state of California working for a game warden had that many bite apprehensions. <laughs> I gotcha. just, the numbers are, and, 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 and it's not really about numbers, but what this, what that story says is, damn, there's a lot of real bad, bad people out there doing this. If she bit 116 cartel gunmen that who knows what other crimes they've committed outside of growing dope, poison cannabis in California, had they murdered people? Had they killed people with narcotics? Had they trafficked kids? Had they done rapes, uh, who, murders? Who knows? Right. The answer to many of them is yes, because we know in researching criminal histories, we would catch them and bite them and deport them and they'd be back and we'd have criminal histories on these some of these guys. So she did a lot of good. You know, she really did a lot yeah. of good. And, yeah. and you said it best when you started to say there were close calls that would have went a lot worse and you guys might not have made it out safely if Phoebe hadn't been on station that day. And the second... The second chapter in Hidden War, I go into that transition of when the light bulb went off, when Phoebe saved my life for the first time. Yeah. And it was the first of about 40 times yeah. in six years of being of running the Met team with my guys and with Brian on every mission and, and, and other canines and other handlers. Um, yeah, if she had not been biting a gunman that was pulling a Russian Torkarov semi-automatic pistol out of his waistband on the ground while under bite duress from this dog on his calf very aggressively... And the other gunman that was this bad guy's partner is pulling a Taurus Judge, one of those three, you know, 44 mag, 410 shotgun compatible uh, monster revolvers right. that Brian had to handle hand on, hands on. And I had to take the Phoebe bite. If she had not been biting that one suspect, I would have been taking fire at about four feet. Right. And the two riflemen running up behind me would have been taking fire as well. And I would have had no choice but to engage this guy with my pistol at contact distance. Right. And, you know, um, we have, we've been in too many gunfights already doing this job and we've narrowly avoided about 40 other gunfights because of the dogs. And it's never a good day when you have to have a gunfight to get home safe. Yeah. It's not good for the suspects. It's definitely not good for the officers. So these dogs, especially Phoebe and champ and all the dogs that have followed since, and that are doing great work on the team as we speak, brother, they, uh, they save lives every day. They save suspect lives. They save op uh, officer lives. Because, yeah, the guy's going to have a dog bite on his arm, shoulder, or leg, and it, it might be cut up. He might need stitches. It's, he's going to be sore for a long time, but he's going to be alive and he's going to go home, you know, um, right, wrong, or indifferent. And we're not going to have to fire a shot. And certainly if we can get out of the woods without having to go through an officer-involved shooting investigation and all, uh, all the things that go with that, um, you never want that to happen. We avoid right. it at all costs, but we got to be ready for it if, if it does have to happen to save lives. It, it, Phoebe it was a was an amazing piece of this of this program, um, based off of what you wrote in the book about her and, and what you're telling me now. What? Um, how long did it take to train Phoebe to get to a point where you felt really trusting of the dog to go do what you had hoped it, it could do? Yeah, um, I can I can speak generally to that. Um, Brian has the exact answer as far as days or months, but it was it was. Two years, two years. Take. Okay, gotcha. Two, and, and and because, and it's not because she couldn't have picked it up quicker, Jay. It was because she was going into an uh, an outdoor environment that dual purpose canines hadn't really worked before. So she had to learn trail signs. She had to be able to pick up and smell marijuana. She had to smell the scent of what growers smell like. Living out there for so many months, eating a certain diet, um, she could actually detect growers based on smell with that amazing nose of hers, you know, sometimes miles before we get to a grow site. Wow. But, but, but how does she sort out when to engage, when not to engage? 
Uh, how does she deploy effectively when there's manzanita in the way and there's coyote brush and maybe there's a big cliff here or it's across a creek? Um, it's, it's just a very, you know, it's like hunting big bucks in timber. Yeah. Uh, or in snow country or in cliff country for big muleys. It's just arduous terrain. And, and how do you effectively navigate around that? Um, not only as a hunter, but now she's got a hunt and arm gunman that's running around and wants to do harm to her. So there was a lot of trial and errors, you know, she yep. missed bites. She did the same thing that I described champ doing in that the later chapters. Yep. Um, just, she, you know, she, she wasn't quite confident enough to know that, yeah, I need to engage now or, uh, I need not to hesitate, <laughs> right. you know, right. because he's, he's, he's real close to pulling that gun and he's going to shoot me or he's going to shoot my handler or, you know, any of my other brothers. Cause right. Phoebe made it a point to, you know, go eye to eye contact with every operator every morning in a briefing, rub up against our thigh, get pets, look us in the eye. And that was her way of saying, I smell you. I know you, I'm yours. I've got you. She was that kind of dog. Wow. No exaggeration. She never bit an officer by mistake in the chaos. And you can imagine, Jay, in these sites, when we got all these guys in camo and face paint and tactical gear, you can't even tell what your partner, who your partner is some no, days. There's no way. You know, when right. you get all that brush and you know, and marijuana and things go western and maybe there's gunfire, there's a chase, uh, there's a stabbing, you know, the canines deployed. Mm -hmm. She never bit an officer by mistake in her entire career. That's incredible. Which is, phenomenal that's right. a that's a miracle given the environment she worked in yep. for so many years and all that chaos to think that she could i i mean yeah it's hard enough for, for the officers to sort that out like is that my partner right over there that i thought was there or is that a is that a bad guy now yeah. just sorting through all all the the terrain and, and the thick brush amazing that she could do all that you know, and then, and then we think about, it is, right? And then we think about like our labs, you know, our, our waterfowl dogs. Uh, you know, I'm a lab guy. I always had a lab as a companion dog, a patrol dog, uh, and Apollo, you know, my, my, she's retired with me. She's 11 now. And, you know, she's still moving around, but getting older. Yep. Um, I remember when Apollo was a four month old pup and Phoebe was, yeah, Phoebe was probably a three-year-old, four-year-old veteran. And uh, it was before Met was formed. And this is a little side story that's funny and because I, I know all the dog people will love it. Um, she was staying at my house in Morgan Hill, California. Brian and Phoebe were staying overnight because we were going to help the Santa Clara Sheriff's Office on a, on a marijuana eradication team mission the next day. We weren't our formalized Met, but I was starting to bring Brian down to help our sheriffs with, her, with Phoebe and Brian because Shasta was so effective and we, we kind of wanted to show other agencies, Hey, you guys can get some dogs and we'll help and you'll be a force multiplier. And, uh, Phoebe typically Jay is one of these super social. I mean, you wouldn't even know she's a bite dog when she's not working belly scratches, tongue hanging out, rubbing up on you, loving just like right. all our Labradors and yep. our bird dogs do. But I remember we had a couple of knuckle bones from the butcher and we were going to give a treat since we, uh, Phoebe was coming to town. So I gave a knuckle bone to my pup and we gave a knuckle <laughs> bone to, uh, to Phoebe. So Phoebe took her knuckle bone, spit it out on the, on my kitchen floor, went over to my new lab, little, little Apollo, a little English lab, looking at Phoebe, like a little friend with a knuckle bone and Phoebe bit Apollo right on the nose, just snapped at her and she dropped the knuckle bone and Brian went ballistic. Hmm. meathead what you're a guest in this house you don't bite another dog got got the little spanking and and slept in the canine unit all night wow right meanwhile my little dog apollo what she wasn't injured phoebe barely hit her nose right. but it was kind of a it was a dominate you know it was it, it was that dominance uh, sure. you know stance but so for the whole next the rest of the night we're going hey wait a minute man phoebe doesn't have a bone anymore because she got disciplined and the bone got taken away where's apollo's bone well my my pup was so smart she had taken the bone and buried it under her dog bed, then jumped back on her dog bed and was leaning on the edge. Like if that big nasty dog comes in, that dog is not getting my dog bone. <laughs> and she was just a little tiny three month yeah. old pup brother. And it was it's the funniest story to this day. And Oh man, this uh, again, I'll get choked up. But I remember when, uh, I remember when Brian called me, I think it was J July or August. I, I go into the book in this, in the chapter when it happened, but he called me to tell me, that he had to put Phoebe down yep. and it was in the middle of our uh, Met season. And we were, he was up in Northern California. I was in the Silicon Valley. I, I would have, I'd give anything to have been with him. What, so we, we could have talked about it in person. And I remember he said, yeah, I, I had to put her down. Uh, uh, and then he was just speechless, you know? And I said, All right, how are you holding up? How's your wife and kids? Cause she was a family dog too. 
I said, you know, brother, I'll never forget that time. Uh, you know, Phoebe came to our house and bit Apollo on the nose right. over dog bones. And we, we laughed together and then we cried together. Absolutely. And then at that point, I just said, I'm going to miss her, man. But man, she had a long life. Uh, she will be sorely missed. And, uh, yeah, the, the, the team took it as hard as Brian did. It was, they're, they're so much part of us. They're just like another operator on the team. I mean, it's not mm -hmm. even a dog. It's just a partner. And uh, she was she was that special soul. And she, she yep. gives us a lot of hope and a lot of encouragement and a lot of motivation to all these new dogs that we bring on. And Brian's leading the charge of, of mm -hmm. getting that training going. And we're really lucky to have had that experience. Yeah, what a, what a great case study. But yeah, we, it's, it's, they're a reflection of our own personalities. And, they, you know, they a piece of that that animal dies with you when they die and it's uh but yeah the memories are are just so great once once you you know just just in remembrance of of the animal it's um really a, a piece of that whole puzzle that i mean can you imagine how things would have been without a dog of that special caliber yeah, I, and thank you for bringing it up, brother. I, I haven't talked about Phoebe in a while. You know, she she's always lingering there, and and it's uh, it's bittersweet, but yep. it's it's great to talk about her. I always feel good when we do. Yep. I know uh, my teammates appreciate you bringing that up, and I'm sure they're going to be watching and listening to this podcast. Cool. And, uh, yeah. and I, I will I will remind them when we uh, when I get to see them again when I'm back on the West Coast. It, it's it was it stuck out in the book. You know, it, it was something that was unique, special and very important you could tell i don't know and you'd express that but there was even more meaning there you could tell that this this was something that that it was unique so thought i thought we should at least go there for a little bit oh, i appreciate it thank you so as this realization unfolded that we've got a major problem that's destroying ec ecology all over the place it's not just the drugs it's what it's doing to our environment you had to start forming special forces. Um, it sounds like you were involved in some very critical aspects of that, uh, including a uh, sniper team, right? You, you developed some of the, the sniper units. Could you uh, kind of explain how that, that came together, why it was part of the, the organization and, and how it played out in some of the real life scenarios? Yeah. Um, it, it developed out of a need and we were very fortunate that most of the guys on the team had either prior military uh, or some tactical experience on local, other law enforcement agencies, um, SWAT teams, things like that, um, either before becoming game wardens or integrating with those teams as game wardens. And um, there was a need for it, which I'll get into in a minute, but I got to talk about the personalities of all those codenamed guys that, that you, you read about in Hidden War. Um, Frog, you know, was a 20 year veteran of the SEAL teams and was a nine year active uh, sniper on the SEAL teams. And a good friend of mine uh, now running the whole cannabis enforcement program. He's our assistant chief in California. And something that was cool about Frog was he got out of the SEAL teams and retired from Department of Justice, uh, working firearms, narcotics, things like that, uh, to be a game warden and do outdoor stuff and kind of take a slower pace, if you will, in yep. law enforcement. Right. And then when I called him to say, Hey, I get to handpick guys to do a, a pilot program and this might turn into a full-time team. I'll never forget the, the response on the phone was damn, man. I never thought I'd operate and push a rifle like that again. Hmm. I'm going to give this a shot. I'm in. I said, well, thank you. Cause your experience and your knowledge and uh, you know, on the teams, especially with everything you did as a seal and as an LE guy, invaluable. So having him, um, Marcos, who's codenamed in the book, uh, Shang, uh, all the guys, um, they all brought an element because behind the scenes, Jay, we had been, I was already a, a basic and advanced sniper instructor with a cadre of instructors in the Bay area with the sheriff's department. Okay. Um, Marcos and I, when we were patrol wardens together way back in 2001, before we had ever gotten a grow, we paid and built our own sniper rifles. We got a, a real good invite to go to the Santa Clara County Sheriff's first basic sniper school. Uh, again, things that our colleagues in, you know, the game warden ranks would be like, what the hell are you guys trying to be? What are you doing? Right. It's, kind it's, of, it's, it's, not, it's not something it's, that most game wardens would be like, is, hey, we got snipers yeah, now. What? Well, why? What do, are these guys going to go rogue, you know? Do, do they have to get, you know, do we have to like isolate these guys? But yeah, so we were doing this all on our own time and dime and, and, on, and when we were on vacation, 
you know, and we were going to SWAT schools and we were going to MP5 operator schools and we were going to tactical man tracking, hunting down, you know, armed felons that you got to track and you might be attacked trying to find them. Because at the time, it was skill sets that weren't only exciting and interesting to us and very challenging to perform at that level and have those skill sets. I knew in the back of my mind, someday down the road, I didn't know exactly when, and I didn't know that it was going to be marijuana related or cartel related. We were going to need those skill sets as game wardens because of the changing, the changing lens of the world after 9-11. Yeah. When 9-11 happened, we literally had... We had either just completed or we were about to just start our first sniper school as game wardens um, with those same guys that were our Met allies that you read about in both books from the Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office, SPAG, uh, you know, Apache, uh, you know, uh, Rails, Snake. All those guys were the sniper team from Santa Clara. Gotcha. They okay. They're lifelong friends. And so not only did we get included in their schools, I got invited to be a co-instructor. I'm a lifelong hand loader, a long range shooter. I've been you know, one of those ballistic nerds forever yep. um, outside of hunting. I'm into the long range thing. So it, it was just fun for me. Um, it wasn't work. Uh, and I was starting to slowly open up spots, free spots through our sniper schools in Santa Clara County that the, the sheriff's office was putting on because I'm, I'm instructing now so I could bring a couple guys in and I would get I would get Shang, I would get Marcos and they could, they could come out on their own timer. They could come out with department sanctioning and go to a school. So by the time we formed met, we already had people certified in all these skill sets. Um, it was just kind of plug and play. But the reason we built the sniper team within met was on these outdoor missions, especially we had these areas where had we had long gun coverage with optics, we could put a, a, a team, a, a, a designated marksman, a sniper observer team, up on an overwatch and some, not all grows, but in some grows, and we could watch the trails. We could know where the campsite was. We could, we could see, uh, you know, quote unquote, suspect movement, grower movement as our guys are coming in, be in that, that eye in the sky, yep. you know, where you're making more observations to get your guys in safely without ever having to fire a shot. Um, and then we started getting used for fugitive recovery from other agencies. We started to get used for, you know, anything terrorist related or, you know, having to do night ops where, you know, with, with a good sniper scope and a good MBG system on your scope. And we had good tools, you know, we were running the latest and greatest in MBG systems and, you know, um, the Met team and the sniper unit Delta team in the name of the sniper team. We had to have the equipment to go out unsupported anywhere in California for up to five to seven days. Wow. So when we have Mount Whitney at 14,000 feet and we did some missions in the Eastern Sierras that I haven't talked about yet, that a spoiler alert in the, the second edition of Hidden War that's about to drop because the first edition's gone, um, we're going to add a couple of chapters. We're going to talk about COVID especially yep. and yep. what's happening on that front since COVID because it's really graphic and dynamic and people need to know. And I'm going to go into some high altitude missions with our snipers that I, that I want to share um, we had to go anywhere in California, whether we were on the ocean, on the beach, we were in the hot deserts of Southern California, the deciduous redwood fern forest of the co the North coast, or, you know, we deployed literally at 12, 13,000 feet, um, 11, 12,000 feet at times Wow! On, on some missions. That's how diverse that crazy state is. So we were finally at the point, man, when we got the funding and we were a full-time team to have the right MBGs, to have the right compact weapon systems, uh, the helicopter support, um, you know, all the gadgets. And, you know, when you look at the SEALs or Delta or mainline military forces or any, any domestic SWAT team near you, near me, and you look at the equipment they need to do now, they need to have to do the job safely. Um, it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of exponentially harder for the game wardens too, because we're going to be out in the bush and unsupported. Yeah. Um, so a lot of good high-end overnight gear, you know, survival gear, layers for snow country. Um, we, had, we had to get all of that to do the job and, and be out there doing what we do. And that's why we put a sniper team together and we're, we're sanctioned to do so. Yep. And it's, a, it's an integral part now of Met still. And, uh, you know, you're not just a sniper. You're a sniper within the Met team. So you're always an operator and an entry guy to do anything Met needs. But you might be one of the five or six long riflemen. And then canines are the same way. We have two canine handlers, sometimes more come to the party, so to speak. But overall, those canine guys are always team guys working with their dog where they need to work because we're not a big team. 
and I wish we were bigger and we're, we're lucky to have what we have, but we are definitely still uh, too small to, 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 you know, diversify like some big agencies yep. in the military. Yep. Gotcha. Has, has there been progress in, in taking this out? I mean, from where you started and what you identified as, I don't know exactly where, where all this began, but from where it began to where it is today, has progress been made at shutting down some of these cartels? Some progress has, yeah. Yeah. Have we got it all? No, by no means. But when you look at the stats that I think are in the letter jacket of the book cover and, and I get into the stats of when we started to finally document accurately, excuse me, what we were taking out on each mission, how many missions, how many grows we were finding, when we had a dedicated team and could do it our way, and, and the, the when I say do it our way, Jay, I'm talking about not only the arrest and eradication phase and taking out that tainted weed so it doesn't make it into the black market and hurt people, <clears throat> but also the reclamation environmental restoration phase. Um, once we identified and we're getting about 44% of all the grow sites are getting reclamated the day of the mission. Um, that was, uh, that was, that stat may have changed. That was toward the end of 2019. But when you look at one team dedicated to this and not having to do all the field patrol work we used to do when we were assigned to a district and then kind of do an ad hoc with the sheriff's and go rate a rate a grow and bust a couple, but you're not documenting anything. You don't know how many tons of trash were taken out. You don't know how much water was was taken, you know, or or uh, diverted. How many guns were seized? How many bad guys were arrested? We started doing really solid, you know, spreadsheets on all of that, and I kept those files and you know for the our administration, and it was mind blowing in the first year the numbers that we were putting up, just our team. And that was a fraction of the problem because there were other federal teams that were still out there doing it too, that we weren't statting at all. So when I look at those numbers compared to the old days, we're definitely making a dent. Mm -hmm. um, we're definitely getting a lot more than 5% of the grows out there. Um, you know, are we getting all of them? No. Like I said, are, are we getting a good percentage of them? Yes, I believe we are. Uh, COVID was a little different. Um, when COVID dropped, and I know we, when we were starting with, you, with your assistance making it possible, when we started the Thin Green Line podcast, COVID was just in its infancy. You yep. know, we were just, lockdowns were starting. We were having those interviews. And I remember talking to my teammates back at home in California, and I'm up here in Montana, and they're just, they're just you know, they're hamstrung. They're like, we can't get together to train. We can't go do a raid right now. We have no idea what's going to come down from Cal OSHA and for exposure because these cartel guys are crossing the border all the time and they're in other states and they're diversified as journeymen to do different crimes. I mean, who knows what exposure they've had to this new virus, you know, when COVID was so fresh. So our Met team didn't get going really hot and heavy till like almost July. Wow. Okay. Which... That's, so that's cartels, a lot of the gap there in right. time. So there was a short window right there, brother. I mean, it, July to September, October is about it for the rad season when you're going to get it before it's already out of the woods and they've already harvested successfully and gotten away with it. So it's been told to me that 2020 was as ballistic and as crazy with as many assault weapons, if not more so than the pilot program in 2013, when we were brand new proving the team, it was off the hook. And I'm going to say just on sheer, um, just from the logistical hangups because of COVID, more tainted weed made it out of the woods this year or last year in 2020 than had we were less effective in 2020 yeah. just because we got a late start. Yep. Gotcha. And so many teams never went in and did anything because they just they were tied up on, you know, medical response and lockdowns and uh, riots <laughs> and protests yeah, right. in some of the western states. You know, it was just, just horrible, horrible stuff. Right, so, right. but we're making a dent. We're, okay. we're definitely staying yep. in the fight and we're going to continue in, in other States, especially out where you're at for these smaller agencies that are starting to see it on refuges and going, fortunately, it's not as blown up like it is in California and the West coast, but how do we deal with this? Our thing is when I talk to other States, I say, look, here's three years of mistakes we made. Right. You know, fail forward, man. Don't make the mistakes we made. You know, we, we failed a lot, <laughs> you know, and we learned as much that's as we how could you learn. Right. Yeah. And we by no means have it mastered, but, uh, tr and, and that's, but that's been a real beautiful part about phase two in retirement and getting to know you through podcasts and going to conventions and talking and to conferences that this is not a Calif a West coast problem. It's, it's a national problem. Mm. It's a much bigger issue. Like you said, than the public realizes. Gotcha. When you're, um, 
talking about the the grow sites and how it's making its way into some uh, i guess the the marijuana and stuff that they use and it's not legalized and it's yeah. it's it's bad for you whether you you agree with marijuana use or not the stuff that that's coming out of these grow sites can't be all that good for you um whether it's and, it's, and so if you look at the legalization of marijuana is there a benefit to that to take does that help take out some of these these illegal sites and does it make it a higher quality marijuana i don't know yeah that's that's a that's a huge question and it's a good question and it's one that i wish i had a positive answer for but what we've learned <clears throat> when certain states have regulated independently while you know cannabis is still a scheduled drug on the federal scale, um, we haven't seen regulation work in any of the states effectively to stop the cartel black market okay. obtain cannabis. And I'll, I'll use California as an example because it's my home state. And it, it was kind of interesting that from the time we formed MET in 2013 till the time I retired in December of 2018, in 2016, what happened during that election, we legalized recreational marijuana in California yep. and we tightened up the medicinal marijuana laws under Prop 64 and some other bills uh, in California as well. And all the naysayers, even within our own agency said, okay, I guess you special forces met guys are out of a job. And uh, I said, I don't think we're gonna be out of a job. In fact, I think we're gonna need triple the team in a year. And people thought I was crazy. Right. Well, what ended up happening was and I talk about this at the end of Hidden War because we had had some time to see Prop 64 in effect for two years. Uh, and that was probably, I mean, I'm not going to say it's the action exciting chapter of the book, but it's probably the most relevant from the standpoint of looking at environmental protection from a cannabis standpoint moving forward for the whole nation, regardless of where you sit on the spectrum. Prop 64 created a heightened black market because it lessened the criminality for trespass growers, i.e. the cartel. So it took it from a felony to a misdemeanor. And if you were a juvenile cartel grower, which there are a lot of juveniles in there under an apprenticeship, if they're good under a good uh, grow boss, if you will, it was a misdemeanor. It, it became an infraction. So a lot of agencies said, wait a minute, it's a flipping misdemeanor and we're going to go risk getting in gunfights and getting into right. the violence with these guys. For a misdemeanor, it doesn't make any For sense. For a misdemeanor and it's legal in other places, we're out. So when you look at that last gunfight chapter I talk about in Hidden War, um, you know, the uh, Sierra Azul part two that's over on the Santa Cruz County side, that grow site was, it was a fortress. Hmm. It was set with AK-47, sawed off shotguns, handguns, military type ammo, you know, fortified positions where their camp was. Um, they had it so lined up just like the same situation we encountered when my partner was shot in 2005. We're very confident that it was the same organization, but they just moved over to Santa Cruz County because that county sheriffs and all those agencies said, we're not touching trespass cartel marijuana. We're going to go bother the mom and pop registered growers and we're going to go home safe. And uh, that was a travesty because now they were working with impunity, just running amok um, and, and very comfortable doing so. And that was the backlash because everybody could get very potent high THC percentage content marijuana from the cartels in the black market for about a quarter of the price of dispensary, legitimized, organically tested cannabis because the legal cannabis growers now were paying so much for permits, so much for inspection. I mean, there was a give and take in yeah. that process. Right. So, and it hasn't gotten any better in California. And long-windedly to answer your question, people ask me all the time if we federally legalized and regulated it with some sort of purity standard like the tobacco or wine industry, would that help? And logically, yes, it would. It would because you'd have this cannabis available to users that want to use it. You'd have a purity standard to it where you don't have all the toxics and the issues we have with the cartels. And you would significantly limit, if not uh, eliminate, and maybe not completely eliminate, but really put a big dent in this black market of tainted weed from the cartels and all the environmental damage that goes with it. So that's been the big talk with the new administration now in Washington of is cannabis going to be analyzed and be regulated federally. And some say it might, some, and it, it might be a good thing. Um, and it's, I'm not saying that cause I'm, I'm not a cannabis user myself. I'm not making a judgment either way. I'm looking at it from a realist standpoint, Jay of being an outdoorsman and a conservationist and a diehard hunter, like all of our listeners, 
I don't want to run across this stuff. And I definitely don't want my hunting buddies and their families and any of our deer hunters that listen to your podcast, taking their kids out for that first deer hunt and stumbling on a cartel grow because that happens on the West coast all the time with first time hunt. Right. Yeah. And I'm not a cannabis user either. I could care less about it, but from the story you're telling and the infrastructure that's behind the illegal part of this compared to the infrastructure that's behind the legal part of this, seems like we need more legal to get rid of all to make it clean not not just right. in the marijuana itself but in the cleanliness of how it's produced yes that's the piece that is really affecting me and and my love of the outdoors and everything that i believe about hunting and all, everything that goes with it that's the part that i'm like yeah let's legalize this thing amen yeah right and yeah so that i could care less about using it but boy i sure care about how it's made yeah. And it's, it's, you know, I just look at this thing and I have a lot of uh, legitimate growers in, in California that are friends and are passionate about the environment, you know, and uh, they, I mean, they're moved to tears when I do a PowerPoint presentation on stuff from Hidden War that's in the book, some of those same pictures. And they're seeing these dead animals and they're seeing these poisons in these Molotov cocktail water pits with the poisons in them and booby traps. And, you know, and they're seeing the heinous dead wildlife. I got mountain lions. I got black bears. I got bear cubs. I got gray fox just laid out frothy mouth that have died within minutes of ingesting just a couple of drops of this crap. And uh, they're so moved, you know, environmentally, they're crying at these seminars. And I'm like, okay, you know what, then let's get out of judging cannabis or users or growers let's look at this thing as an environmental thing that we can unify on. And um, when some grower groups up in Northern California started terming our Met team, their earth warriors, I thought, okay, that's different. I'll take it. Right. You know, and where we used to meet them in handcuffs, they're coming up and giving us hugs and handshakes. Right. They're not as intimidated, you know, when we're on the same battlefront from the trespass grow problem. Um, That was one thing that we, we got to see that other cannabis enforcement teams that do have to inspect the legitimate quasi legitimate growers that some may be in violation, some may not be, and they're still finding violations. So they still have that, you know, there's still that abrasive relationship, but um, we were able to, you know, kind of skirt that Switzerland, if you will, and kind of walk the line on both sides. And really that's what it gets down to, man. You said it best, what you care about as a hunter and outdoorsman, what are we trying to protect out there and what, you know, what safety levels do our public have to have guaranteed before they feel safe enough to go try a new sport, like being a new hunter. Right. Yep. You know, so where do we go from here? What's, I mean, what are the challenges that, that you're facing beyond this? You did a great thing in writing the book, which then you got into, um, Joe Rogan, you know, one of the, the, the biggest podcaster on the planet. You were able to get on his show, explain what's going on and talk about the book you're um you're part of uh, warden's watch now with wayne saunders uh and started the thin green line podcast as well can you kind of tell about the journey you've been on to promote the concepts behind this and and where this should go from here yeah that's that's a good one too um education and outreach getting the message out as far and as wide as i can i i think that the fact that um when you look at the title of the, the book we're talking about today, Hidden War, and I remember being at the NRA annual meeting, my first one I'd ever been able to attend in Indianapolis yep. uh, last year, uh, Colonel Oliver North, who you know was a guest on our Thing Green Line yep. podcast fairly recently, he was still the president of NRA then. And the cool thing about Colonel North was he had he took the time and was gracious enough to do the digital review copy of Hidden War before it dropped. And with his experience, military and political and everything else he's done, uh, and being a big conservationist himself as a hunter, um, even he was blown away by the level of damage environmentally these cartels were doing. And he was really impressed with the fact that there was a game warden team specializing in, in it and that other game wardens, why they may not have a you know quasi marijuana enforcement team, but they were still dealing with that in other states. He said, I had no idea the depth of this at all after everything I did with, with the, the, the counter drug issue. Right. He said, so here I am watching game wardens do this in America. This message needs to get out and we need to have this book out at NRA annual and, and get this and promote it. And that was the start of making me realize that if someone like Lieutenant Colonel retired, Oliver North doesn't is, is getting so alarmed by this and doesn't see the depth of it until he reads the book. 
that was an eye opener. That yeah. tells me that 10 years of doing the, you know, 15 years of special operations, one book in 2010, 2020 or 2019 outcomes hidden war. And I'm still getting people at book signings going, dang, Lieutenant, this is crazy. I had no idea this was happening in our country. I got to read this. I got to give this book to so-and-so and so. And I said, that's exactly, ma'am, sir, exactly why we named it hidden war. And this, this thing's been on national, international television. We've done numerous uh, high level investigative, you know, press stories on it from CNN to Fox to ABC, NBC during the time I was on the team. Second book is thankfully to guys like Joe Rogan and yourself and, and the outreach capability I've really been blessed to have since retirement. Hidden War has really gone everywhere. It's a bestseller and on Amazon and, you know, you the Audible's doing really well for everybody that wants, can't read right now because they're doing stuff in their houses or they're driving. Right. right but people are still shocked by it. I'm still getting feedback every day, Jay. Like I had no idea. I had no idea. What can I do? What, what do I need to be aware of? What safety measures do I need to take? So we need to keep pushing the message continuously. Um, it, it's, it's a tireless thing we got to do. Uh, we definitely need to support our enforcement guys, regardless of what agency they're working in. Um, but especially our conservation agencies that are dealing with this problem because they are ultimately going to be the ones that are not only going to, you know, try to take the public safety threat out of circulation, meaning the armed cartel grower, and then a tainted, toxically tainted marijuana plant that we don't want to see into the black market and hurt our public, but do the reclamation and restoration of these grows, take back the waterway, stabilize the banks, take out the trash. Because I go into this in the book and I was able to sit in on a very high level, what they call a plaza boss. And for our listeners to understand a plaza boss is an upper level cartel operative that is responsible in a particular region of a, a state or a, or a region of the country for 50 to 100 grow sites, let's say. And that's their plaza. And we were debriefing him because he was taken in on another narcotic charge. But he was very candid uh, in his interview um, to basically validate things we sort of suspected or sort of knew, but we didn't have anybody on that side of the fence to really validate it for us. And what really got some of these agencies, Jay, believing in reclamation and cleanup is when, I'm, when this plaza boss is telling me, yeah, we're starting to see some of these growth sites you guys get. And then we go back in to try to put a water system in the next year and use the same site because we know how overworked and out, you know, we're going to, we're going to out, we're basically going to outproduce you. We're going to put so many grows out there that you're going to get lucky if you get 50% of them, you can't get to them all. But we go into these growth sites and it's all cleaned up. Three miles of water pipe. We had to do a diversion on. The dam is taken out. It's, it's you know, grasses are growing. And I, and I asked this guy, I go, well, are you going to put another growth site there? He goes, no. Hmm. Why would we? You've already raided it. So we know it's on law enforcement's radar somewhere. And now you've taken out twenty dollars to $40,000 of infrastructure that we put into place and we're going to have to risk putting all that back in there. And when they put, when they dedicate a, a pair of growers to a grow site, what, what what our listeners have to understand is these aren't just random farmers. These are guys that are vetted, super good at growing cannabis, super good at diverting water on gravity-fed water systems and hiding it. I mean, I admire them. I have nothing but respect for these farmers. They are amazing, and how well they do it in arduous, steep, rugged, dry, hot conditions. Um, but he said, I'm not going to put two of my tier one growers and all that money and infrastructure for one that you guys will likely check eventually because it's already been in your system. Right. Light bulb <clears throat> went off. And we, we started to prove that to the other agencies because we would go in and, you know, like now in the winter and early spring, brother, we would go in and scout these grow sites that were rated a year, two, three, four, five years before that we reclamated. No activity. But if we hit one big one, in a traditional, what we call a historical grow area, and we couldn't reclimate it, and that stuff was left out there, or another agency did a raid and didn't reclimate, it could be back as early as the next season, and definitely by the, the season after that, within two years, right. almost 100% of the time. So that's the message, too, that I got to keep promoting and pushing that, yeah, we can throw bodies at this problem, but those bodies have to be committed to nationwide reclamation. And I've been asked to be part of um, an advisory board member for a new um, nonprofit uh, foundation called Cannabis Removal on Public Lands, CROP for short. 
And what they're doing is they're bridging the gap nationally of bringing funds and education in for primarily reclamation and education to offset the, co the cost of that, that we just don't have resources for, especially in some of these smaller states that have the problem and just don't have money for it. Yep. Gotcha. Fascinating stuff. Just the, the book is, is a great read. I'm so glad that you, you're putting it together and getting the word out there. I think, you know, you put down the rifle and you pick up the pen and I think you're more dangerous to the cartels now than you were when you were raiding sites. Um, yeah because you're doing such a good job getting the word out. So you are not a cartel's friend right now at all. So I, I no, I, I don't want to be their friend. That's no, for sure. I don't, <laughs> I don't either. You know, and, that's and, what, uh, and I got to thank you, man, for being part of that, part of that thing green line to help, you know, um, I'd only say this as a friend and as a fellow podcaster, but, um, every one of us that love our outdoors, our wildlife, waterways, and wild lands are part of that fight. They're part of the hidden right, war fight. Right. They really are. Yep. And uh, it's part of that thin green line we talk about on the thin green line podcast. Um, game wardens are so small. And Wayne and I were just talking about this three hours ago on our, on our, our podcast. Um, man, we are, we are, st <laughs> we're a needle in a stack of needles. As far as numbers go there, we, there are so little of us out there that if it wasn't for hunters and anglers and passionate environmentalists, there's no way we'd find this stuff. There's, and you know, po poaching cases, or grow sites. Right. Jay, I mean, our Caltip turn in a poacher program in California, when I retired, 70% of all the calls we were getting on that program, they weren't traditional poaching violations. They were grow reports. Gotcha. A hunter found one. Right. Or this guy on his property diverted water. Or I was hunting with my son for his first A zone deer tag and we stumbled into a water line. And, you know, so that's really what it's going to take. And, uh, and we're going to, we're going to keep pushing it. It, it looks like, Federally now, there's a big notice of this um, because one thing about the Hidden War promotion and the message is I was able to go national and get out of the West Coast when I retired. And uh, before COVID dropped, um, you know, COVID, <laughs> we talked about again this with Barry Kirsch today. It, it was really weird to go from being on the road, pushing the message at book signings and conferences and speaking engagements and teaching things with other agencies and conservation groups um, that we're all, you know, passionate about, um, to go into zoom, you yeah. know, just come to a screeching halt, not getting on the road and it, kind of a blessing in, in disguise. You know, I was, right. I was suffering from some burnout. I wasn't around. I mean, had just relocated to Montana, built, built the dream house on family property. And I might've been here 30 days in 2019. Maybe it just, it's one of those things that you start losing it, you know? Um, yep. and, and, and like our met guys on the team, I, I make a, I make an analogy to how hard they have to work during the grow season and how hard they train out of the grow season and scouting. And I look at how few they are. Um, and we just need more people aware and more people fighting it and taking it as a national priority. Like some of these right. other you know, right. political priorities we see out there. Yep. Gotcha. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about some, some hunting. I know, yes. uh, you know, we, Love it. we, 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 I, you know, I could talk about your book all day long. There's so much yeah. to talk about, but yeah, let's talk about some deer hunting. I mean, as a, as an outdoorsman as well, yes, you spent a lot of time in the, in the field doing your job, being a warden, but you also enjoy the outdoors as an outdoorsman and, and your wall tells all kinds of stories, just looking at it behind you. So let's, let's talk about some deer hunting and some, some hunting that you do. What, uh, what does hunting mean to you as an individual, not just as a warden? Man, hunting is, hunting is life. Hunting is spirit. Hunting is hope. Hunting is light. Hunting is strength and confidence. Um, and I'm throwing all those words out because, you know, I think hunting is grounding. It's centering as well. And I know for me, I mean, obviously I grew up as a hunter and I was inspired to be a game warden because of it. But I remember when I got into doing the job, I was in my early twenties and I remember for a, it was it was honestly eight or nine years before I harvested another deer since I was a kid. Wow. Because I was, I was putting so much effort into being the best game warden I could be and hunting criminals, the two legged animals, you know, that are really bad guys. Right. Um, and I got to a point where I was turning down offers, you know, uh, invites to hunt and go on out of state hunts. I'd never been out of California and hunted out of state yet and any of that. Um, just because I didn't, 
I didn't want to break away from my district. I wanted to embed in that those first two or three years in Southern California. And um, when I got back to Northern California in 1995, I met a lot of people that I had not worked with before in the conservation area, informants, ranchers, uh, landowners. Um, and I started hunting wild hogs again, really hard. And oh, I started cool. Hunting, nice. Hunting black, black tail deer, you know, um, I'd taken just a couple of small black tail deer, uh, with my ex-father-in-law before he passed, he was one of my mentors and my reloading, my hand loading coach yep. when I was 15, but I never harvested a mature black tail, uh, until I was over 30 years old. And then, uh, you know, I was so bit by the bug that I was getting cl uh, closer to spend more time in Montana and, Man, like I got two really, really beautiful bucks uh, on this this beautiful wall of conservation memories for our family. But timber whitetail in the Yak Wilderness in this part of Montana in the cold are by far the toughest deer that I've ever hunted throughout the country. And I've taken, you know, I've taken a coos deer in New Mexico, which was a fantastic hunt, blacktail. Uh, you know, um, the Sitka blacktail on a great Kodiak Island hunt with some game warden buddies of mine, but it took me forever to put in the time and the patience and get lucky enough to harvest a really close up dense wooded habitat, timber whitetail. They're tough. And <laughs> They're they, tough to yeah, hunt. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And I was so, you know, I was so late in, in hunting to get to them. And this one, this one, uh, five point behind me, I remember, um, I'm going to tell you some family secrets here, but my dad, before he passed my uncle, Steve, who's still, uh, still here and was my, my, my main, really my main mentor. And I, I want to thank him on the podcast because I call him, I call him the woods ghost. Yeah. You know, he's the guy that was, nobody stalks more silent. Nobody sees more big animals. Nobody gets into so much predator chaos, uh, mountain lions, moose, wolves up here, sometimes wolverines, whatever, than him because he's just he, nature talks to him. He's just, he's just in tune yep. and he, just, he disappears in there. He floats. So I actually learned the stalking tactics and the patience that made me a good sniper and really made me a good game warden to sneak on people that needed to be snuck on, so to speak from him. Hmm. And I pounded the woods with him for years and years. And I shot some smaller bucks up here, you know, some one twenties and 110 inch deer, but the, you know, our timber whitetail up here, like, like you guys back East, we get some 250 pound monsters up here right. and we get some, I mean, these things are Goliaths and coming from California and being a black tail deer hunter early and seeing these guys in the rut, you want to talk about an adrenaline dump. Right. <laughs> I mean, I have less adrenaline dump during gunfights with cartel guys. And I do seeing a buck like that <laughs> in the rut and I'm shaking like buck fever. Like, yeah. I don't think I can make this shot. Right. <laughs> you know, right. he's snorting at me. He's blowing. His rack looks like a freaking chandelier. His, his shoulders are just, just girthy. Like I've never seen, yep. man. This thing yep. looks like a tule elk in California. But, uh, I remember, um, finally getting to the point where I told my uncle, I said, you know what? as a sniper, we want to, we want to be in a hide. We want to be able to sneak into a hide. We want to be able to get into an environment of the, of whatever we're trying to observe or whatever target we're going after disappear in that environment and be completely proactive where we're, you know, we have the element of surprise. We have the advantage of cover concealment, uh, noise discipline, and we're going to surprise you. And he said, well, you can do that, but it's really cold so the tree stand thing is going to be really tough. The ground blind thing, maybe a little better because maybe you put a heater and you're going to be in dense timber. You're going to have to hike this stuff in places, you know, blah, blah, blah. And it was just one of those things where I finally said, hey, you know, um, we have a little bit of private property access where we can put a stand in. Um, not, no one's doing that up here. Right. Um, I'm going to try it. So 2005 and 2005, Jay was... Man, that was a pivotal year because that was the year we had our first gunfight that my partner was shot and almost killed. Yep. So I was already kind of whipped up about all that. And that was August 5th. And then I came up in 2005 in late October to Montana. And I spent the whole month here. The first time I spent an entire month here at my now home county diving in because I really needed to process and get past and think about where we were going to go career-wise. There, there was some heavy stuff going on mentally after that shootout. Um, right. sure. with the cartel, with the new cartel element, I, it, it was, it was, I couldn't get it out of my head. And so I said, I want to, I can, I can imagine why not. I mean, it's, you it's, know? that's yeah. some, some powerful 
imagery that you just put in your brain and there's no yeah. way that's coming out anytime soon. Just crazy life-changing stuff. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of questioning things we were going to do and where we were going to move. And I said, I want to go and I want to hunt Montana for the white-tailed deer season. If I draw a non-resident tag, make it count. And I'm going to stay out there until I either freeze to death and get frostbite and hypothermia and they pull me off as a frozen corpse or until I get a big buck. And <laughs> some dedication well, right there. Oh man, it was crazy. It was crazy. So I, I, I literally, uh, my uncle and I found a spot that we had been looking at. We had done our research. We had watched, you know, everything from, from drop horns in the spring, the temperate zone where the big uh, dominant bucks were moving through in the general areas where they lived in this one spot um, where there was good migration trails um, where there was not a lot of traffic and where there were not a lot of uh, logging or timber roads very close. So the likelihood of me running into people in this area was slim to none. And I found the right tree and he said, okay, you're going to do this. And I had a single, single seat climber stand Yep. and I set it up and I would, you know, hump into that thing every morning. It was about an hour and a half hike to get into position under a headlamp. Whew, some dedication. But it, it, it was crazy, you know, and I'm a California kid and I'm in, you know, a foot of snow, but I'm right. going to do it. Right. But I was excited, man. It was like a Met mission on steroids and I was alone out there. And, you know, I, I came from a state where I had never been in a situation where when I'm in, you know, climbing that hill in the morning to get to my stand and I turn off my headlamp for a minute and I just look around and listen before first light. I mean, it was not only intimidating, it was just breathtaking. It was just motivating to no end. And then I turned the headlamp back on and I'd see this, you know, the, 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 the crystal like glow of fresh snowfall, Yeah, you know, as it starts to crystallize and freeze and harden when the, when the, when the powder stops. And, um, I said, this is like a wonderland, man. It, it's like a movie set. It, it I can't believe I'm going to be hunting and the big buck's going to walk through in this stuff. So I get to my climber stand and I had a video camera. I had a whole high eight millimeter back in the day, old school. Yep. And I was starting to do ad hoc filming and trying to capture my hunts, especially because I was hunting alone so much. And this was, this was the spot. So the first day I have this about a 120, 120 inch five point, you know, beautiful body on him. You know, um, I'd see him every third day on his rotation and he'd walk 50 yards to my right. He'd do a big circle and there was some natural, like, I don't know if it was clover or grasses or something under, you know, the, the, the pine needles that they like, but there must've been some minerals, something was going on. And he would do this full semicircle and then come in and it, it, you know, it, it just tells me how smart these deer are when you've put a tree stand in an area that's a pretty small tree stand, but they know every little nook and cranny of their habitat. Right. And he'd kind of like see the stand and stare me down, hmm. but I wasn't moving. I had a face mask on and I was completely camouflaged. And he would just look, you know, and then he'd look down and he'd look up, he'd stamp a little bit, yep. but he'd, he'd continue to feed. And I mean, I was so close to this buck, man, the little beep to activate the video camera would startle <laughs> me and come up. That's close. And, so, <laughs> and I had never videotaped bucks before doing that. So my heart is racing. I'm like, this is great. If I don't see another thing today, this made my day. And then I spent two full days, sun up to sundown in that stand. And realized that this was a first light to about a, a noon thing. Yep. And then it, it stopped. Yep. So then I could change, you know, fill and flow with what you learn with your recon. And now I'm doing, I'm doing till noon and then I'm going back in and I'm going into the family house. And there's my dad, my uncle, what'd you see today? And so like NFL film review, like coaches, let's review some tape. So I'd put the <laughs> tape in the machine and they're what, and, and I, no exaggeration. I filmed 43 animals that were either bull elk, cow elk, or legal bucks to shoot before I shot him. Wow. And so, and, and, you know, I was having snowstorms happen during some of this, it was rut. So I'm watching these does push through and these big monsters come in behind yep. pushing the, the ass on that doe. And I'd never, I'd been, I'd heard the stories from my uncles when you're in it, you'll know it, it'll blow your mind. Well, now I'm in it. They're oblivious to me in the stand. They're running 20 yards in front of me in a blizzard downpour and I'm just videotaping them and I'm bringing these tapes home, brother. And I'm putting the tapes in, I'm thinking, okay, that's not as big as my uncle's biggest one. So I'm going to pass on that one. I'm going to pass on that one. I'm going to pass on that one. And my uncles are watching this tape and they're going, <laughs> dummy, <laughs> right. why are you filming? Why aren't you shooting? Right. I could, well, that's, that's just a nice five point. It's like a 140. He's like, that's a monster timber buck, man. Look at the mat. Did you see the, 
LJ, get out. What? No, 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 no. Yeah. Re-education camp. You need to be reprogrammed. You know? Yeah. So I was, but I, I was filming some great stuff, Jay. It was magical. So on the eighth day of that ordeal, and I filmed 43 animals, a lot were much smaller than that big one I'm yeah. talking about, but mm-hmm. I had two or three keepers I should have shot. No exaggeration. Um, but on the la- on the eighth day, windy day, snow had stopped. I had some snow on the ground. Blue skies kind of opened up. The tree stand was rocking a little bit. Just, just that, that neat feeling. I had done my last rattle sequence of the morning, my rattle and my grunt. It was about 11 o'clock. And I think I was getting a little impatient on day eight. And I was kind of tired and I was kind of wrung out because I'd been eight days straight. So I said, okay, I'm not going to sit till noon. I'm going to sit. I'm going to rattle at 11. If nothing comes in by 1130, I'll give it that 30 minutes. I'm out. And sure enough, at 1125, I still cheated. I just started to get up and I had rattled 25 minutes before. And I just heard that beating thump and 80 yards above me. Here he comes. Hmm. Just boom, 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 coming in hot in the rut like another buck was in his territory. And he squared up behind a big spruce tree uphill from me at about 80 yards and there's his ass end and there's his ma- his left main beam sticking out and I'm watching him through my rifle scope and he's a monster and my heart just starts racing and I'm getting that buck fever in my scope. I have a Swarovski three to 10 on my model 70, my 270, a 140 grade Acubon hand load. That's just that lights out, lights out rifle. And I'm going, Oh man. All right. I got to calm down before he steps out. I can't believe I'm <laughs> this I'm buck fevering out I right. mean, I've hunted yeah. for years. Right. And he stepped out just enough. He looked back toward the stand and just as he turned his head, he gave me that shoulder shot and, uh, and I got him. Wow. And when I walked up on him, I lost my freaking mind. And I have a, a videotape still where I set it up and did a narration and thanked my uncle and my dad and went through the whole process of how many days and just rambled. Yeah. Um, but that by far was the rite of passage. And I can't tell you how freaking excited I was to get home and show my dad and all my uncles up here. Cause they're all veteran hunters and they've shot some beautiful animals up here and really pounded these woods, you know, in our November rut hunt nice. in the deep timber. And it was just a rite of passage. You know, it's like, I wanted to impress my mentors and I came home and my uncle, my uncle, Steve, typical, you know, man of very few words, you know, if he's going to be a ninja ghost in the woods, he's pretty soft spoken. He just kind of walked to the truck and it's, you know, pull down the tailgate and I'm all, what do you think? Yeah. He just goes, no, nope, you finally made it into the Benoit club. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, what? He goes, yeah, we have a Benoit club. Didn't your dad say you can be part of the Benoit club when you get a real mature over four or five year old five point. And that's, that's Western count. That's not Eastern count. That's, that's a 10 point with guards. I'm like, oh, all right. So I'm in the club. He's like, good job, LJ. That nice. Goes, he, and then he grinned and just said, I helped you put that stand in. And I was wondering, we've, we've had a bet here in the family, how many days you were going to go before you took a day off. Right. And you said, I need to rest. And Jay, you know, I was learning those, those whitetail um, behaviors where, you know, that within that five to seven day period, that dominant buck in the area, I knew he wasn't shot. He was going to come back through there, but I just, I didn't want to miss it. Right. You know, I just didn't want to miss it. And I never had to hunt that way in the West ever. Black Taylor, you, you know, you hunt them open field spot and stock and they're Roman. Right. It's just so different. And, it, and it's just, it's fun. It's great. It's still challenging, but, but man, that was, that was really cool. And then, um, that was, the, that was the standout buck story. And then in 2007 in a whole different area that I put a, a ground blind in, um, and this is, this is the other big one that you can't see, I think in this, cause he's on the other side of the wall and the camera's not picking him up. But uh, that one was was freaky. Um, I put a ground blind in, and I'd hunted it constantly for two days. And we had it just a little too low elevation, so we were seeing the edges, you know, just the bellies and, and just getting some of the main beams, some of the dominant ones coming in in the rut and working does. Yep. We would never really get a shot. So, I again, talking with my uncle, we had kind of found this area like the 2005 spot. And I said, you know, I think we got to push this thing up higher. He goes, okay, let's let's do it. He goes, I know there's a bedding area up there, but we don't want to push the bedding area too hard, Yep. but we can get on the fringes. And we, brother, we ended up finding a magical spot up on this meadow that peaked out and it had three pressure ridges that all came down on it. And I looked at it and I always think, uh, not only as a hunter, but as a hunter of bad men too, I look at tactical layouts and I, you know, from, from grow experiences, from doing grow ops, especially, you know, where these guys are going to set up, especially if they need a tactical advantage. Yep. And it's no different for hunting and with animals. I just, I, you know, kind of, kind of 
play with that same type of mindset. And so I found this spot and, you know, four massive spruce in the middle to hide the blind. I said, we both looked at each other and that's it. And we moved that ground blind, set it up, descended it. And I just got out of there. I wanted the area to cool off. And I, I went up there two days later and I crawled into the blind at first light. And something I do if I have the room in a ground blind is I'll bring a journal. Yep. And when, when, you know, when there's a lull in the activity, I'll, I'll journal some thoughts, I'll journal some whatever. You know, um, I, in fact, I wrote the introduction to War in the Woods, my first book, on a little mini laptop lap writer in that very blind um, a couple years after the, when, in 2009. But in 2007, that first morning I crawled into that blind, uh, I hadn't been in there. It was barely hunting light. I didn't even have my rifle really set up. I didn't have my rattle kit out yet. You know, I was just getting my stuff put away and I just heard. <laughs> and this monster, man, he's coming on that pressure ridge off my oblique angle to my left, coming in from the west. And he's bombing down the main trail, which is I was just off of because it was a top of a pressure ridge. The dominant boy, big boy for the area. And he, he like literally put his front hooves into the ground and skid when he noticed that the ground blind in his peripheral vision was 15 yards to his right. Mm. It was so unusual for him. He, that's how blows my mind, brother, how much these deer are aware yep. these mature bucks. And he just, he halted. And then I, he turned, he turned 90 degrees and looked at the blind. And I didn't even have that window opened up to make a shot. I had a little peephole where the three zippers came together yep. and I went, Oh shit, this is not good. I can't get the rifle out and I'm peeking through the hole and he's, stomping, blowing, snots coming out of his nose. I see eye guards about six inches tall. They're spiked and forked, you know, in the bit, really dark horned, just a beast. And he's challenging the ground blind. I'm like, okay, I better get something going here. So I'm slowly trying to unzip that one zipper. I'm pulling my 270 up. I'm creeping it up. I get the barrel out the side of the blind and that startles him. He jumps up, does a 180 in the air, lands, goes five more yards, and I think he's history. And then he decides he's not done. So he stops and turns around again. And now he's only like 20 yards away and he starts stamping again. And I, you know, I, and I, I did a scope cut on my eye on this cause I, I blew it, but I came up and just brought that gun in so tight to try to get a shot. Yep. Cause that's the side of the door. That's the side of the window that my, my seat was closest to yep. and got a brisket shot on him and he just dropped. It yeah. was like an, an 18 yard shot. Yeah. And uh, the videotape came out, and as I was getting the videotape ready to debrief it, I feel all this wet on my forehead, and like what? And I turn the camera screen around. And, oh crap! Scope cut right here, and uh, just a magnificent buck. I think I sent you the picture of, of both those bucks, yeah. actually. So, so it's like uh, uh, it's like your tattoo, right? Your scope tattoo. It's a tattoo. It's right I love passage, it. Right of passage. I can still feel the cut right here yep. under the eyebrow. It's all good. Yeah. Um, it is. Yeah, that was. Those were, those were two. And I've, I've hunted all over the world now and had some amazing hunts. The mountain goat in, um, on glaciers above Valdez, Alaska, that was a bucket list hunt, but nothing was as challenging of trying to, I'm not going to say we've mastered it up here, but you know, know what to do, where to spend most of your time, where not to waste time. And now we just, we just have a blast. And it's one of those things where, if I don't harvest a deer for three years, I'm okay with that. Yep. You know, we have CWD tags and we have doe tags we can get for our meat, but or our meat animals. And I just, uh, I just like having the opportunity to be out. And the best thing is no coverage for this thing. Right. Those locations. Right. That is nice. And it's something Barry talked about on today's podcast to get away from the rock and roll world, man, is get in his tree stand and that thing doesn't work. And I'm telling you, brother, I can't tell you how uh, centering and grounding not having just being detached from technology is, uh, and, and I just, you know, I, I get, I almost get anxiety wishing I had more of it. Right. You right. know, with yeah. the way our worlds are, is, is they become, but, um, but those, those two bucks by far, I would say are the, uh, those are the most special hunting experiences yeah. from, from the big buck standpoint ever. Yeah. Um, and I haven't told those stories in a long ass time. So, uh, beautiful. Save them for the big buck <laughs> registry. I like it. But it is interesting to think, I mean, that you took some of your professional strategies of tactical advantages. Like, where is the tactical advantage uh, of the perpetrator here? And he applied, oh, this, this is where the buck would be if they, or where they're probably watching me from right now, or where they, you know, this is the area where they 
are going to have the best vantage point to survive yep. and uh, applying that to, to deer hunting. That's crazy, but very, a, a great observation. It's, it's yeah. exactly how to go about your, your approach to the hunt. And if you can figure that out when that dawns on you, when you've got that moment, like, yep, that's how it has to be approached. Man, the whole world changes on the, in the deer woods. You're like, Doesn't okay, it, it really yeah. does. Like understand their vantage points, what they need to do to escape and survive and yep. where they can watch for anything coming their way. And I, I, you're right. I think these big mature whitetails, whether it's a doe or a buck, it's like they have Google Maps right. built into their brain. Embedded. Yeah, embedded. embedded in it, like they, and it's to that walking viewpoint that, you know, the virtual tour that Google can do yeah. for you. They yeah. have that I in like their brain. And yeah. the minute that there is something out of place that wasn't there yesterday. Yeah. Or 10 years ago. It's you know, crazy. That's new. <laughs> they know. Yeah. And they, they understand change and, and, and boy, do they react to change. And I, I've, I've seen this and just, just in like deer yards in New Hampshire where the, the snow gets right. deep and they, they observe and, you know, you can, it's funny, they, they will, you can be on it. Like I was at, I stayed at the snowmobile cabin one, one year and we were on the deck and we were having some, some adult beverages and just kind of chit chatting, you know, and the deer would come walking through the yard and it was no big deal. But the minute you stop talking, boom, gone. They understand change. So if you just carry it upon your day or if you decided to get off the deck and go down a level, they were gone. But if you were just kind of out there doing your thing like you weren't paying attention and you didn't pause the moment at all, then they were okay. But the minute yeah. anything was off to them, anything, something went from nothing to something or from something to nothing, that's a change to them. So, right. you know, you start to understand, well, how do they process information? That's, that's a good way to approach it too. It's a tactical advantage that you have as a human with, you know, opposing thumbs compared to what a white tail does, who's off all off of instinct and, and yeah. just years and years of learning how to beat the predator. You know, and that's, that's it. You hit it on the head, Jay, when you say to beat the predator and they are, they're the experts at it. And one of the things I noticed, um, they're the ones that, they're the ones that have the control out there. They move silently. They know their environment, right? Um, like you said, they, they notice change immediately, almost peripherally, almost like subconsciously. Right. So, and I just knew that in snow conditions, when the ground's that cold, and even in, in powder snow, just the noise you make to get close enough to get a shot in that dense timber, you just can't get a big buck that way sometimes. Right. You know, I mean, uh, my uncle told me many stories of where he literally almost lost feet a couple of times to get some of the monsters that are on his wall, where off came the boots, he kept the wool sock on, and he's trudging in icy snow for a couple of hours to go 30 freaking yards. Right. I mean, he's doing like a Carlos Hathcock Marine sniper scenario. Right. And there's that big buck with a big deadfall. He can just see his main beam and part of an ear and he's bedded there. Cause he's got the best place. You can't sneak up on him. And I go, well, I could try that. And I've tried it. And you, some, you just got to get lucky if you're ever going to get that shot. But you know, I got, I got to lessen my, my failties as a human being in their environment. I got to get in a spot where I can be silent and quiet and let them come to me. Yes. Cause I don't, these, these timber white tail up here when the ground conditions are a certain way, um, just because it's so choked up, as you know, good luck. Yeah. Good luck. I, I had a, uh, well, code name Marcos, you know, my good friend and lifelong hunting buddy and game warden partner on met and a fellow sniper. He was up here hunting with a non-resident CWD tag with me just last, just November of last year. And, uh, you know, we harvested one buck while he was here. Um, and he had a couple opportunities and they were very fleeting, very short, you know, and he sat with me in a stand and we did a little ground blind stuff and we did a lot of spot and stock. He goes, you know, man, you know, we've sat for days on sniper ops and on med ops and I'm used to that. He goes, but up here in this cold, it's just hard to sit for that long. Right. But he goes, I see why you do it and why you have to do it. And he's hooked. So, yeah. you know, now he just has to, yeah. has to punch that tag and, and, and just have that magical experience. But, um, 
yeah, I think that's the only, and my, and honestly, my family thought I was pretty crazy doing what I was doing. And now they're like, Oh, Hmm. You setting up your stands yet? You got your cameras out? What's going on? And, you know, we kind of compare notes and it, it's an unorthodox way to do it, but um, it's a way that just keeps me connected, yep. you know? Yep. Um, and you guys, you guys are the masters of doing tree stand hunting back East. It was something I never did in California and I just love it. It's, it's that whole, like, like we said, um, you know, in, in, uh, in tactics, we call it an LPOP listening post observation post high ground to monitor movement. Um, right. In snipers, we call it a uh, primary hide or an alternate hide final firing position, FFP, you know, for all those law enforcement, military acronyms, but you're right. It's, it's the same way in hunting. And that's why you see so many military veterans and law enforcement guys, even outside of uh, being game wardens, really enjoying hunting, especially after their careers and, and really diving on it. And I'm seeing a lot of, you know, people in my line of work retiring to this part of the country because they can get out and, and kind of learn for the first time. Right. You know, right. You can yeah. Teach that makes dog. sense. Can, I can see that yeah. now. Yeah. That makes yeah, a lot can, of sense. You can teach an old dog, new tricks, right? Right. But we're always learning. You know, I, I love still being able to learn and as frustrating as it is, and I get burned nine times out of 10 with these bucks up here, at least I got to see one and tell the frustrating story, you know, right. It's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's awesome. So let me, uh, let me hit you with uh, 10 rapid fire questions just to kind of, okay. kind of sum this up here. Um, all right. Love it. What's your Shoot. number one hunting tip of all time? Patience. That's a very good one. Yeah. Um, be patient. Sometimes the, we have these things that we feel like we might be unlucky if we don't have this item with us or you leave it in the truck, you leave it at home accidentally and you're in the woods and you're like, oh, I can't believe I forgot my blank. What's that one thing for you? Oh man. Um, can't believe I forgot my rattle. Yeah. My rattle. rattle. Yep. Yep. My yep. nice and hail, uh, rattles, rattle, rattle box. Yep. yep. That's a good one. What's, uh, what's your biggest pet peeve in life? Not, uh, not feeling as effective every day that I need, that I want to feel effective. Okay. It, it's with myself. It's not getting enough done, um, in a day or not being productive enough in a day. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, on my own worst barometer on that, I have way too high expectations, even in phase two, my family gets on me, you know, uh, but, but yeah, I just, um, I just think there's so much life to be lived, so to speak, and every day, and I try to make every day count. I don't always, I don't always, I don't always punch that clock, so to speak. Right, right, gotcha. So, how old are you today, John? Fifty-two, as of November twenty-first last year. All right, so fifty-two. 52. Is a change. All right, yeah. so knowing and going through everything you've gone through in life now, right. if you could speak to the twenty-five-year-old John Norris, what would you tell him? Oh, that's a great freaking question, and it's an easy one to answer. I would say. Enjoy the moment more often. Be in the moment more often. Don't think too far ahead of what you got to do tomorrow or next month or next year. Savor the case you're making. Savor the hunting experience you're making. Give yourself extra time on the books to spend with quality people, whether they're family, whether they're friends, great hunting buddies, you know, great friends on podcasts, whatever the case may be. Savor the moment because. My biggest thing is my motivation level is sometimes a hindrance, Jay, and I'm going, I've never told this personally to anybody. I'm glad you're bringing it out is I always know five things I need to be doing that haven't got done yet. Right. It's just the way it is. And, and, and to be effective in our careers and, and, and try to be the best you can. Um, I've, I've missed some things, you know, I've missed some things. And then I get to a point now where I look back on my career and I go, man, that was a great hunter. That was a great operation. And I wish we had, I wish we'd spend another day. Yeah. You know, just hanging out with the team or I wish I had spent two more days in Montana when I could have been, but I felt I had to get back and teach this class or what, you know, whatever the case may be, yeah. um, savor the moment and make time for those special relationships. Cause nothing's more important than that. Yep. That's a great answer. Nothing's more important than that. Yep. I completely agree. Uh, you're at a, uh, convention somewhere, uh, uh, okay. either hunting convention or some kind of, uh, convention with uh, law enforcement and you strike up a conversation with a stranger in the hotel lobby and they ask you what you do for a living. What do you, what do you <laughs> tell them now? Uh, I say, um, you know, I, I just quote my brand. I say, I'm, I'm, I'm a proponent of the thin green line. And yep. then they ask me that question. What's the thin green line? What does that flag mean right. on your car or whatever? Right. And I go, 
you got a minute and we have a conversation. Yep. And I say, I'm, I'm everything about um, protecting public safety in America. I'm everything about protecting and propagating and promoting conservation and love for the outdoors, whether you hunt or fish or not. And I'm definitely a patriot of fighting for the beautiful things we have in this great nation of ours and not taking them for granted and trying to educate everybody on how important it is not to take those things for granted. I feel like you've had this actual conversation with somebody. I already. haven't, man. No, I don't. Other, you know what, Jay? Other than Mike Ritland, I haven't had any Q&A. Gotcha. Mic drop. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah, this is fantastic. What did you have for breakfast today? Uh, a banana. Banana. Okay. Been right, just right. a banana. I've had two back-to-back podcasts, so uh, uh, but I'm looking forward to a big lunch. All right. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. You get your own bill, billboard on the side of a highway. It's a blank canvas. You can put anything you want on it. What does it say? Oh man, um, I don't know. It'd be something thin green line. Yeah, it would be. It would, it would be something. It would be something to do with a thin green yep. line. Yeah, I would yeah. too. I mean, that's such an important message that you're that you're yeah. relaying on. I it's 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 bigger than than just the book. Like there's there's some it's so serious, much bigger. So much yeah. bigger. Yeah, and I I think I think you know, and 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 again, I'm gonna give you a shout out because you've helped me even outside of the podcast promote the thin green line with my brand with your expertise. Um, and even my brands in firearms with recoil, let's say, or, you know, product sponsors for the thin green line film series. There's so much more than, than just playing with good toys and going out and hunting animals. Right. I mean, there's, there's such a bigger message to the thin green line. And I think it goes so much deeper into American values that are so, uh, so delicate right now. Right. And they're so vulnerable yep. for lack of a better word. Um, so yeah, it would say thin green line and it might have underneath that fill and flow. Okay. And fill and flow for the listeners that don't know, you're going to see this in hidden more. If you get a copy or an audible or whatever, fill and flow was our team motto for the marijuana enforcement team to say that the world is so crazy missions, no matter how well you plan them, we're going to go sideways. We're never going to freak out. We're going to fill and flow with whatever's given to us. Right. Yeah. And in COVID in the change of the world and the polarization politically that we have, I think fill and flow is just, it, it has a ring to it of, a little bit of acceptance, a little bit of tolerance, a little bit of adaptability and not being so rigid in our judgment of ourselves and others. Um, and at the same time, always overcoming adversity and not, you know, you know, not failing and getting out of the fight any earlier than you have to. Right. Yeah. I like that. That's the fill and flow. I'm going to adopt that one for myself. If I say the word successful to you, who's the first person that pops in your head and why? Oh man. Um, Wow. I'm kind of blanking on that. I'm thinking, I think my mom. That's yeah. a great answer. Moms are, yeah. are so successful. And, 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 and the reason not giving is, enough credit. No, she doesn't. And, you know, there's there's a story about her. She was, uh, we lost her at 47 years old back in 93. So she passed very young. I had just graduated the Fish and Wildlife Academy. Um, and even though, you know, she had a, she had a hard situation health-wise and growing up, um, she gave us so much. She gave us so many tools out of a very small toolbox, myself and my siblings. I'm the oldest of four. My mom called us the wolf pack. I was alpha, obviously being the oldest. And I did a lot of taking care of my young ones while she was working multiple jobs. But even though she had it hard, I look at what, not necessarily my career, but I look at my sister being a retired San Jose fire captain and the great work she did. My brother being a, you know, uh, a, a brilliant electrician. And I mean, he helped build the Levi stadium, the 49ers new stadium in, in, yep. you know, Santa Clara, he ran that project. Just amazing. And my youngest brother, who's a, a film and video editor and, and, and documentary filmmaker and, uh, stuff like that. Um, I think she'd be super proud and I think she was super successful because it could have went a lot different for all of us, Jay, to be honest. Right. Um, and I, I, I hope she's aware. And I think she's, I think she's hopefully seeing that, that uh, all that hard work and sacrifice she put forth, um, man, it really paid off. Cause I'm, I'm really proud of my family and I'm really, that's pr- awesome. Uh, I, I'm really proud of how everyone's uh, developed. That's great. That's a great answer. What's a day in your life look like? Uh, they're very different. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, we're we're going to talk a day in phase two, like now. Um, yeah. yeah. So, you know, the, today is kind of a, a typical day for the winter. We're not in the middle of hunting season because if we if we were in the middle of whitetail season right now, I wouldn't even be home yet. Right. But right. Um, this is it, man. This is um, either hosting a podcast or being on a podcast. 
networking with more people that I do outreach with, um, scheduling training, scheduling teaching, uh, you know, doing a little bit of social media. Yep. I'm not a big social media fan, but I, I have to do some of it given the brand and outreach and the role I've been blessed to have. Yep. Um, and then it, it'll, it'll end up being, um, without a doubt, cause I'll have the time today. And because it's not too, too cold, I think we're going to have a high of 16 or 17 degrees today. I can bundle up safely with a face mask and I can do my trail run. So I'll get a run in, yep. get a little PT, get a little cardio, you know, um, even on the cold, cold days, man, it's beautiful out there. I just got to go slower. I got to be smarter about, you know, breathing in cold air, but sure. Um, I'll do a little bit of that and then there will be a, there'll be a good meal by the end of the day to celebrate a good day. It's nice. been a fantastic podcast with you and a fantastic time having Barry nice. Kirsch on our line earlier. All right. So here's question number 10. This is the last one. It's interesting. You said, well, if it was a deer hunting day, I wouldn't even be home yet. Right. The next, the last question is what's a typical deer hunting day in your life look like? Oh man. Um, okay. Get up at four ish out the door by five leaving the truck by no later than 6 a.m., knowing it's not going to get dark till or get first light till close to 8. And any of the spots I hunt up here, let's say, if it's a Montana hunt, I'm going to be I'm going to be hiking for an hour to hour and a half. And it's not necessarily a distance thing, but it's uh very cold, so don't sweat before you stop, right? Yeah. So I'm kind of thermal climbing as I'm climbing that hill to be really careful. Uh and then I'm going to sit for at least 4, 5, 6 hours. And then I'm probably, if I haven't harvested something in one of my spots, I'm going to be doing a, I'm going to, I'm going to walk, I'm going to walk some spot and stock areas that have, you know, good chance of something coming by either on a migration trail or an integration of two canyons or, or something like that. Um, and, you know, we're, we're pretty much done by about 5 PM during the dead of deer season here okay. in Montana. All so right. that, that would be it. Yeah. Sounds good. Well, one of these days, maybe I'll come out and join you. I've never been to Montana. It's always been Brother, a dream you of have mine. An open invite. You Very come nice. join me and we'll have a heck of a fun hunt together. I that would, would love be that. amazing. Yep, yep. absolutely Head amazing. So, John, would tell us where people can find you once we leave here today. I think I mean, we're pushing two and a half hours. Hopefully, I'm giving wow. Rogan a run for his money as far as Yeah, that's length. one of our longer ones, brother. Yep. It does not feel like it's been that long. It doesn't. It doesn't. Where where can people find you? Where can they find more about the Hidden War or what's coming up for the Hidden War and uh, the podcast that you're involved with and maybe other interviews yeah. that you might be on? Yeah, we'll start with the book. The book's available on Amazon. Um, just go to Hidden War hyphen John Norris, and you'll you'll find it on an Amazon search. It's available in hardcover, which has all those cool pictures in it. It's on Kindle and it's on Audible, like you mentioned, Jay. Yep. Where I got to read, I got to read and narrate it um, for a really with a really good, uh, actually, Billboard artist producer and, and um, Audible book producer in Georgia. And the sound effects in there, as I'm sure you'll attest to, are pretty cool and original scored music. But it, it really sets a tone. Um, you can find me on Instagram at John Norris, all one word at J O H N N O R E S. Facebook is the same. My website that kind of encompasses everything, the books, my signature trailblazer folding blade and series of blades and the outreach I'm doing other podcasts is, uh, John Norris.com J O H J O H N N O R E S.com. Um, the thing green, the, the two podcasts I do co-host with the help of you grateful uh with lieutenant wayne saunders also out of new hampshire where uh, you're at brother yep. is the warden's watch podcast available on multiple platforms and now new for 2020 we branched off to do a second podcast under the warden's watch umbrella called the thin green line which isn't limited to just game wardens and their stories it's anything to do with conservation so um, we've only had 12 episodes but man have we had a diversity of really cool patriotic conservation oriented outdoor, you know, lovers of the outdoors, um, uh, podcast guests. And, uh, we really encourage people to jump in. And, uh, today we actually had, uh, you know, a rock and roll drummer for the multi-platinum touring band Shinedown that have been together for 20 years. They're right. a drummer who happens to be a tree stand hunter, just like you and me, Jay. That's great. Amanda's and an outdoor cook, like you wouldn't believe on an open fire. I mean, he is a, a culinary chef for a wild game out there, second passion to music. So, Tune in for that one if you guys want to check another podcast out. Um, we just had him on. And uh, yeah, if you want, people ask me a lot of questions about how to become a game warden. I get a lot of kids that I love to mentor and help any way I can. Uh, hidden more questions related to safety out there. If you're running across a grow, you can direct message me on Instagram or Facebook Messenger. You can also hit me on my website, 
which is, I'm not at my website, but my email directly, which is trailblazer413. That's trailblazer with a Z413 at yahoo.com. And a lot of people ask about either personalized signature blade packs, Jay, or a personalized signed copy of Hidden War. Just email me or direct message me through any of my social media, and I will do shipping through Venmo and PayPal payments and put together very nice personalized packages if people want something more personal than, than getting an Amazon book. Yep. Yeah, very good, John. And just real quick, and you mentioned this when your your uncle said uh, you you've joined the club. The, the you've mentioned Benoit. What does that mean? Um, it's I don't know. It's an old like French term because we you know the our name is French and it's it's something my dad said like oh Louis Benoit and I think it was a a group of people up here that were way back in the early 1900s, late 1800s. That family, the Benoit family that uh, were notorious for being just those diehard successful hunters that got all the big bucks. So when my dad settled here and he was a lot younger and then my uncle and my uh, Keith and Steve. So my whole group of uncles and my father, they ran, they were kind of a wolf pack of hardcore hunters, man. They hmm. left the house and didn't stop hiking, you know, till dark. And uh, their whole thing was when I came up to do my first whitetail hunt uh, with my dad, about a year before I started with a fishing game officer, I was looking at, mounts or i was looking at drop horns and he goes okay now this is a benoit club buck i'm like okay a benoit club this is a benoit club buck nothing smaller than this and i went all right so that's uh yeah it, it just comes back to an old family that had that history and that, that is history. interesting and the reason Isn't i it? i wonder about that is because in new hampshire uh, and out of in new england there's the benoit family okay some of the most notorious big whitetail hunters and tracking hunters there that, you go that the world has ever seen um, yeah. and not too long ago called the the best deer hunting family in america um and and i've worked with lane who's since passed but and the family is getting older but for quite a long time they were they were very big famous skilled beyond skilled deer hunters that all they had was a their trackers a, a rifle the deep timber, a uh, GPS and go is basically no. how it went. So wow. yeah, I wonder yeah. if there's a connection there. That is very there, there, interesting. I'm sure, I'm sure there's a connection because uh, my, my family has been so hardcore into whitetail and followed it countrywide. Um, they could very well be referencing that family or an extension of that family. That's what I'm wondering. Maybe so, there's a relative, yeah. some plant landed in Montana, some landed in Vermont and maybe yeah, there's a it's, Canadian it's a connection. Revered, yeah, revered name of respect, Jay, for sure. You know, like right. the Benoit Club, man. That you, you made the club, and I'm like, wow. Yeah, okay. yeah. If you make the Benoit Club in New Hampshire or New England, that's the same equivalent to what you're describing. Yeah. That's very yeah, interesting. Maybe, some, maybe someday I'll get to meet a real Benoit. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> well, we'll make that happen sometime for sure. Yeah. Well, awesome. John, I, I really thank you for coming on the show. I really appreciate you and everything you've done. Um, every all the moments you've spent in taking out bad guys and, and, and exposing this on a much larger scale than than just keeping it contained within when a department in california this is huge and i i can't thank you enough for bringing this to light thanks brother i really appreciate your help in bringing it to light it's just been a blast to talk to you today and thanks for all you're doing for us for the thin green line on so many other levels besides just this great uh, big buck registry uh platform Love your platform. Um, honored to be here. And I uh, really appreciate the time today. Thanks for having me on. And now it's time for the review of the week. This week's review comes from SkyDad08 on Apple Podcasts. Jay, I know you're busy in life, but man, you got so many people wanting more podcasts. Love your podcast, sir. Well, I appreciate that, SkyDad08. We are trying to pick up the pace here a little bit and get back on the mic. I can't guarantee anything, but the idea is to put out at least one show per month airing on the third Thursday of the month throughout 2021. So hopefully we can stick to that schedule. Um, but thanks for the review and sky dad. 08. If you would like, uh, shoot us a screenshot of the review and we will get you out a hat or t-shirt of your choice. Just remember that we'll pick a review or question to read on each podcast episode chosen from one of the podcast directories. And if your review or question is chosen, we'll send you a hat or t-shirt of your choice from our Big Buck Merchandise store at BigBuckMerch.com. All you need to do is take a screenshot of your review and text it to 724-613-2825. So get your reviews in now and earn yourself some Big Buck Merch. 
Well, that's a wrap, ladies, gents, and fellow predators from the outdoor crew here at the Big Buck Registry World Headquarters. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you next time right here on the Deer Hunt Podcast.